going on guys tonight we are talking about the fps coin wallet let's, let's get go. into it welcome right everybody. at the drop <laughs> let's go uh, so this is a really fun product the uh the fps coin wallet by brent braun who we are going to be interviewing very 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 shortly so stick around very soon. for our uh, our interview <laughs> we're doing this behind his back so Tell he hasn't me. joined the stream yet no so he's not seeing this he doesn't but... even know we're reviewing this right now no no which is the fun part you guys are seeing what it is before he comes on so uh but <clears throat> i mean let's just get into this thing uh fps coin wallet um it's a snazzy really? little wallet yeah it's a very snazzy little wallet this is uh this is really really great for especially if you are a big coin worker somebody who does a lot of different coin routines it's so versatile uh you can use it for a, a ton of stuff uh, i think brent's tutorial his instructions are great uh he goes over so many different applications it for is. this but yeah, it's not a coin purse. It's a little bit more uh, masculine or gender neutral. You know, it's like you can be you can be anybody and use this. It's not necessarily as uh, as feminine as as some purses out there. Yeah, that's what I always think. And I, maybe it's I didn't get into coins. I'm not a coin magician. I will say that. But uh, but I always felt a little yeah. weird when the guys like pop their little wallets open for their mm -hmm. coins. I always yeah. felt like that was a grandmother's coin wallet. Like my grandma yeah. had one of those for her change. Yeah. this is very stylish i would carry this um, yeah because it, and you know obviously my background already handcrafted is leather work mm -hmm. and stuff and you know so i've seen all the different magic wallets uh over the years and most of the time i will be honest they're crap mm -hmm. they're absolute garbage materials uh they feel so flimsy uh this you know is actually really nice so i remember when i got it i said wow this is really quality the stitching is really good uh because you'll see a lot of times with stitching uh you know you get missed stitches and people just don't care they just keep going uh yeah and you, it, yeah brent even talks about that at the beginning where of the tutorial where he's like yeah this wasn't going to be a product originally came mm -hmm. up with the idea for all the different magic utilities and this is a magic device it's not just a coin wallet by the way there are definitely a lot of magic utilities of this but he talks about in the beginning of the tutorial how really it was just that he found such a great leather manufacturer he was like i've got to put this out because it's so high quality leather yeah. that we can actually make a really good coin wallet that's different from what's on the market yeah and that's that's what i like is this feels like a wallet that's going to last a long time there's other wallets that we've reviewed or looked at haven't reviewed them all yet but we've looked at and you know and the first thing i pull them out of the box and i go this is crap yeah but i go usually that's my first thing is i'll say to you this thing feels like a piece of garbage. This there was one wasn't... wallet that I really liked that I showed you, you and you were just, I, I love that wallet. And then you were just like, ah, but the leather is pretty rough, right? And I was like, ah. yeah, yeah, it's not the best. I can't but... use that wallet. I cannot carry I know there's lots of people that carry it around. I cannot carry a wallet that to me feels cheap mm -hmm. because I make leather goods all day long. Uh, and so, um, you know, this is a, definitely a different material material leather style that I then I would use uh, personally myself. But um, but this is fant I'm dropping it. But this is fantastic. Uh, as soon as I got it, I, I was looking at all the edges and stuff to see, you know, uh, you know, how everything was done. And every single part of this thing is is quality. Snaps are great. You know, even that sometimes you'll get a, a wallet and you can't snap it. Right. Oh, yeah. This, this everything about this really is good. just really premium feeling. Also, if you're a user of the FPS wallet, also by Brent Braun, which is a great product in and of itself, then this is a perfect uh, kind of uh, pairing with that because hmm. he sells it in the same different leather variations and colors as uh, as the FPS wallet. So if you have an FPS wallet, you can have a matching coin wallet that's really snazzy. Yeah. Pull that out. And, that's what uh, I like and too, this is great. Sure. You can and so um, as someone who doesn't really perform much coin magic or any at all to be totally honest um i know some but i i really respect the friends of mine that do a lot of coin magic and i think that what they do is beautiful and so i wanted to ask them their opinions of it so i went to a couple people uh especially uh cameron braxton and eric caraballo who i think are two of some of the best coin workers that i know and asked their feedback 
and they were really blown away with this this coin wallet they were like oh it's definitely different from what's on the market it really stands out and they were saying that they would pay 45 to 50 dollars for it and when i told them that the price point was only 30 dollars, they were really excited uh yeah so yeah and that's what i would say for me to make this for you uh i i would charge you the same it'd be like 40 bucks probably or 45 dollars because uh just the stitching and stuff alone it's a, it's a lot of work um you know and, and I, like i said it's it's very quality done like i said they've rubber coated all of the edges so you're not going to be wearing those down it's double layered uh everywhere so you're not feeling like any cheap or crappy in inner material like you would on a lot of wallets they've double layered all the leather yeah. so i would easily say this is worth more than the, the 30 dollars that they're charging yeah and uh, there's the you can be really really creative with how you use this when it comes to um you could store like four to five morgan silver dollars inside of this thing um yep. and it has this extra backpack functionality which is really nice so that you can which you could use for either uh, having an extra coin that do doesn't come out when you dump the coins out, but then you can steal and load in for, you know, for a secret reveal or a method for a routine later. You could also make things appear inside of the wallet. So you could have an extra coin or two appear in the wallet later on in the routine because of that secret storage functionality um, and the ability to both load and retrieve things from this super easily and instantaneously within the routine. That's kind of why it's the FPS wallet and uh yeah it is uh it's just great in all those functionalities i was talking to cameron braxton he immediately the moment he saw it came up with new functionalities in this that weren't even included in the tutorial such as using this for the hanping chen move so if you guys do any kind of like table coin magic then i'd say it's like really a must-have uh because there are so many things that you can do with this and uh it's got a lot of magic functionality for pretty much any routine that you're doing that involves more than one coin if you happen to yeah. be a guy who only retention vanishes at one coin and that's the only thing you do maybe you don't need this i mean maybe it, like a, a nice holder and, to put your one coin in yeah it just but, looks cool yeah. to have your one just coin looks, and be like yeah one it just looks coin. cool to just be like this is um, my one coin and then you could have a second secret one that's <laughs> in here that you load but it. uh it's really really great also the fact that they're this is going to last you a lifetime. There are no fragile components inside of it. The way yeah. that the leather was designed, the points that are stiff and the points that are soft are really well manufactured so that this can re this does everything that it needs just with the leather functionality alone. So this can yeah. really last you a lifetime. And uh, you're going to, so, the more you wear it in, the better it gets. The question of the hour is scale of one to 10, what are you rating it? I'd say as a coin wallet, I would give this. It's tough because I'm not an expert in coins, but I'd say in 8.5. 8.5, nice. Uh, as a leather worker and someone that appreciates the the work that went into this and the, the craftsmanship of it, uh, I'm going to say this is a 9 out of 10. Um, obviously, for a coin wallet, uh, compared to, you know, we just reviewed the gravity reel. Obviously, on a scale of the Gravity Reel and this, they're two different products. But yeah. as a coin wallet, just as a wallet in general, uh, I might even use this for some mentalism stuff. I'm trying to come up with some mm. stuff for the backpack. Oh, with billets um, and things, dude? Yeah. This would be great. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. Yeah, I think that is it's really great. And I don't even know necessarily why I'm saying 8.5 because I don't have necessarily any gripes about it. Yeah. Um, I think that it does everything that it's supposed to do exceptionally well. And it's the highest quality version of this on the market. So I'd say go for the coin, this coin wallet. There's no reason not to. If you do coin magic, it's a must have. That's why it's nominated for one of the tricks of the year right now. But yes, where can they wallet. find this? Well, for a limited time. You can get it for the next 72 hours on allaccessmagic.com. Check out the shop. Uh, and if you're one of our patrons, I mean, you're getting discounts on it. You're getting so. huge discounts on it. If you're a $10 <laughs> patron, then you're getting 10% off. If you're a $25 patron, you're getting 20% off of this. So you're getting just a huge discount marked off of this incredible product. So definitely check it out. And Gravity Reel is still up right now. So check out Gravity on our shop as well. Now, without further ado, let's get to the episode with Mr. Brent, Brent Braun. Braun.
Here we go. What's going on, guys? Welcome to All Access Magic. That's a new little way we're going to start the shows uh, with Behind the Gimmicks. So I yeah. uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, and now, I mean, they already know who the guest is tonight. They already so. know who the guest is today. It's so already again, we already said without further ado, but we have to let them know that this week we are joined by Magic creator and consultant extraordinaire, the man, the myth. The legend, Mr. Brent, the man, the myth, the legend, bro. What's going on? How are you, gentlemen? (laughs) I'm exceptionally well. Fantastic. How about yourself? Oh my gosh, a cold, but that's okay. It's just cold everywhere now, right? Yeah, but I'm good. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on, guys. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Brent, uh, you said it's cold. Where, for people that are watching, where are you located right now? So I'm in, uh, let's just say Louisville, Kentucky. I'm about five minutes. I'm in Indiana, but I'm about five minutes from Louisville, Kentucky. And it's like, I know that there are places that are colder out there, but I don't know. It's like 18 out there, which feels super cold for me with a wind chill. It's like six degrees or something. I'm sure that I was worse or something, but it's, it's cold. That sounds that sounds pretty cold. Yeah. Now yeah. you are also sitting uh, in your magic shop, yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. This is uh, the the I like to call it the Shadows and Chandeliers Theater is what we're currently sitting in, mm. which is a little nice. thirty seat close up theater where we have magicians come in from around the country to do shows. Well, that's awesome. Shadows and Chandeliers yeah. sounds very mystical. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. yeah. I can I, show uh, you. Like, we can look. We can tune over here. I can show you. That's the. Like, let's do a quick plug. What is the name of the the shop as a whole, though? If people are yeah, the shop is uh, J and B Magic Shop and Theater is the shop, and then our website is brickandmortarmagic.com. That's a, that's a sick website name, like brick and mortar magic. Like, yeah, I'm I, surprised I, no I, one got that. I know, right? When I finally decided I was going to do it, I was like, I, "Is this really going to be available?" When I came up with the ideas, like, "Is this really going to be available?" Um, yeah. Because we try to treat the even the online stuff. We try to treat it like it's real brick and mortar, right? Like all my customers have access to my phone number and to my text messages and chat boxes. Like, there's a thousand ways you can get a hold of me, but you're not talking to an intern. When you send yeah. a text message, it goes to my phone. So we treat it more like a, a legitimate brick and mortar magic shop, which is why we try to hold that that moniker of like. You know, you're buying from me. You're buying my time. It's the same thing yeah. you guys are doing with. I heard about your Patreon and your discounts and stuff, right? Like, I encourage everybody to go purchase from you all because that's how you all can afford to be here, right? They're buying your time for that money, which is important, right? That's that's what we need to do is support independent small people creating things uh, yeah. because we just have the time to care more. That's at the end of the day, that's it, right? Like when somebody buys the FPS coin wallet from you all, and I hope a bunch of people do, but when they do, when you guys get those purchases, it changes your day and it changes your mood. In a way that that big box, no offense against the big boxes, I shop with them as well. But those big internet sites, when they, when they sell sixty dollars, they don't care, you know. Like, but for me, I care a lot, and for you all, you know, somebody purchasing ten of those things today will change your week, right? Which is crazy. That's it. That's it. That's the cool part. Is like every time we get a patron, we immediately hop on the phone with each other. We're like, hey, we got a new patron and stuff, right? And we're excited. And you know, things like we did games night with every with all the patrons last week. I think that's been such a huge thing. Has been really the community engagement with our patrons. Is it's been amazing. Like becoming friends with them and getting to to hang out and see. Like you know, we have some pretty cool people that are in the Patreon. We had hilarious times. Like I was not expecting how much we were going to be laughing during the game night uh yeah that was great. yeah yeah no, and that, we'd like to we'd like to start off the episode just shouting out all of our, our patrons really quick uh just uh thank you so much to grant h ben jones leonard michaela uh thomas conger drew p denny corby uh pavel garvin smith christopher garrard and rob burns and leo so thank you guys so much for all your support awesome yeah yeah, we we were. I was almost crying last week, laughing when we were playing some of the games. It was pretty fun, but that's awesome. Um, but I love, like you said, uh, I, you know, I have already handcrafted, and for a while, for a while, when I first opened the site, because it's an site? online it's site, I uh, I had everything. I had all my phone number and everything, but then I was getting phone calls from like different countries at 3 a.m. in the morning going like, hey, can I get a card clip and stuff? And I was like, oh, this is crazy. I'm not sleeping at all. But uh, but yeah, uh, but I appreciate that. That's super, super awesome. And now, you know, hopefully no one's spam calling you and stuff. But 
Yeah, we, we still get it. that, right? That, that yes. always, obviously will always happen. But I'm also good about understanding who's in my database and actually buying from me and yeah. who isn't. And I'm not afraid because I don't need to have a million customers or a thousand, like whatever, because I don't need to be Penguin Magic. If somebody's yeah. bothering me, I just don't sell to them anymore. I just fire them as a customer so I can spend more time with the people that I care about and the people that care about me, right? Like, it just. I like just, the idea of firing somebody as a customer. <laughs> oh, it's the best, <laughs> it's the best thing you'll ever have. <laughs> no, it's the best thing you'll ever have. When somebody calls and complains and they're like, I saw this discounted somewhere else. And you're like, I'm sorry, we just don't operate that way. Uh, if you want to yeah. continue a link to their shop and you can buy it directly from them, hell, you could have probably already had it at your house. Why are you wasting yeah. my time? And they're yeah. like, you can't talk to me that way. And I'm like, do you know who I am? I, mm -hmm. I own the place. I can do whatever I want. And she, they're yeah. like, well, I won't buy from you. And I go, and I don't care. Thanks yeah. for calling, right? Like, yeah. You know, it's so. true though. I find the same when you do a live gig and stuff too. Like you have some clients that like really appreciate what you do and really yeah. respect what you do for a living. Uh, and then you have some that are like, I'm above you. You're the entertainment. And I'm like, and I will never work for you ever again. That's it. That's you it. Know, and, I'll and the, take my like, paycheck and see you later. <laughs> you know, right, right. I, I do this because I love what I do. Yeah. I don't love what I do when my customers a jerk to me, right? I just don't have the time for it. So, and, yeah. and you know, I'm lucky enough that I have those few hundred customers that that help keep us open and help support us in a heavy way, and that just means that we can be successful, right? So, I don't need, you know, like some customer that's just going to call and waste my time and complain and then buy it someplace cheaper anyway and then call, like you know, I just, yeah, um, you know, it's just not worth it. Yeah, and that's well, now, that's the real thing is being brick and mortar is that you have that personal relationship with the customer and that, you yeah. know, that, yeah. And, yeah. Well, and, and the thing we talk right about, now, it seems like a lot of it's curated and it's really good effects, really solid things. You're not like penguin where it's just literally every single thing on the market is thrown up there and there's good, bad and everything in between. Yeah. And I talk a little bit about that in, in my, my group. Right. And that is that like when you're a big box and there's a new product that comes out and let's say it retails for a hundred dollars and you're going to sell a thousand of them. If you decide that the ad copy is bad or the product's bad, if you make the decision not to carry it, it's going to cost you $100,000 in revenue, right? The same product I'm going to sell six of, which means if I decide not to sell it, it costs me $600. Look, I would probably sell out for $100,000, guys. If I had that customer base, I'd probably lie to you to sell you stuff also. But I don't <laughs> have that customer base, so I don't need to. I don't have to yeah. sell you something that's not true or lie to you to sell it or say there's no magician's choice when there is, or, you know, I don't have to do those things. I can be completely honest with you. And it goes back a little bit to me to one of the core things that I, and I talk about this in consulting a lot is performers having sort of a mission statement, right? A character mission statement. What does your character want to express, right? In, in as few words as possible. And very early on the magic firm, uh, I came up with making better magic. And that's mm. what I stick to. I stick to that core value of, is this decision I'm making right now going to make the people in my bubble is it going to make their magic better? I don't think it's going to make magic better. Like that's an impossible lofty goal to believe that I can do something that makes all of magic better. But if I can make Ryan's magic better by not selling him something that he'll, he'll never use or something that'll break or something that's deceptive, um, if I make his magic better, then he makes my bubble better, which just works better for everybody in my bubble. Because now everybody says, yeah, everything I'm getting here has been helping me become better, right? And then we're all just, yeah. just helping out and, and being a community there, right? Um, there, uh there used to be a magic shop by me about half hour, 45 minutes from me. They used to do weekly videos of like, this is terrible magic, like or magic products, right? Cheap, cheap products. Mm. And I thought they were fantastic because I mean, some of these things, you know, it's $70 or whatever, and they, the owner got them and they're falling apart or they don't look like what they look like in the advertisements. And so they were kind of calling creators out going, this is crap. Uh, yeah. Just so you know, don't buy this product unless, you know, sure. you know, and uh, enough after a little while, I guess enough people were coming at them or whatever that they had to stop doing it. But I, yeah. you know, I love the shop for that. I appreciate it because I was like, you're saving me 70 bucks and then me trying to return this product right. as well going, this is yeah. garbage. So, so we do that. We do that same thing in our Facebook group, right? We have a uh, private Facebook group for brick and mortar magic.com. And one of the things I do there is unboxing videos. So I take nice. in the newest product, I unbox it and I help you understand, is this something you're going to use or is it garbage? And it's amazing how many products I just burn to the ground. Right. And say yeah. like, this is total it's garbage. Total. Never use it. It doesn't do what it, it's just amazing that magic is one of those few sales industries where we can lie to you to get you to buy something and then make you feel like it was your mistake because you thought it was something it's not, mm. right? Like yeah. too many people go, well, I guess this isn't what I wanted. And they put the $100 thing in their drawer 
not realizing that the manufacturer lied and cheated to cheated to sell it to you. It wasn't your fault. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but we have this sort of adage that we're selling secrets, which isn't true. And, and then we also have like, you know, there's just tons of magic manufacturers that aren't that are in it just to make money. And, and I don't understand why they don't. I mean, all the videos I've done where th products just simply don't even work. And it was a 37 cent fix in manufacturing. And they don't yeah. even put 37 cents more. Like I just say, just care more, just care 10% mm -hmm. more to put the extra 35 cents into each one to fix it. And they just, they don't, they just, it's so bizarre. It's so hard to understand. So yeah, it's weird. Yeah, weird that's a, I mean, yeah, there are way easier ways to make money than to sell deceptive magic tricks that yeah. are not good. Like why? I mean, it, it, especially in this community, it's like you might as well just be passionate about it and try to contribute something rather than thinking that you're going to just do it as a money grab. Yeah. But, and recently we've seen videos like promo videos that are designed to show they create a trick that has multiple methods so that they can show the same trick three times in the trailer. And you can't mm. ever catch the method because they're switching the gimmick between each mm. video to prove to you that it's not what you thought it was. Does yeah. That make sense? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, but there's this new. I don't know how freely we can talk here without getting in trouble, but I don't care. Have we them can talk as freely me. as we want, man. I was gonna say, have them email me if you want, but there's this product that somebody put out. I don't know, called Flat, which is like the steel ball bearing that that vanishes, and it's very clear that it's in his hand and it rolls back and sticks to a magnet on his wrist. But then they show it again from the other angle, and it clearly doesn't roll back. And that's because you get like four gimmicks, and one of them is a metal ball on a pull that goes up your sleeve. And then one of them is a wrist and you can't use them all together. There's no way you could sequence them to work. Right. But yeah. all they want is three individual clips that cancel the method of the other individual clips so that you'll buy it and go, wow, this is a steel ball that really just vanishes. Vanishes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Which it's that's, not. Right? That's but diabolical. It's uh, horrible, right, right. But I, I totally understand. Like it's genius and horrible all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, it's genius doing, for, for selling something, for sure. but it's terrible ethically what they're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. They're yeah. selling a thing that just can't be done the way that it's done. And then of course, you know, it comes with a 17 minute video or something that doesn't explain to you how you would use it in a routine. It's like, if you want to use this yeah. one, use this one. If you want to use that one, use that one. We've seen a couple bad ones recently, right? We, yeah. we saw, again, we, have you guys seen this coin vanish called presence? I haven't. It's, it's a coin vanish. That's sort of like a fickle nickel. But okay. it's three feet of thread wrapped around your ear to make a coin vanish. That's all I'll say. <laughs> what are you doing? I like, mean, honestly, uh, honestly, I feel a similar way about a recent product that's come out that is a watch that its only utility is to vanish a coin. I don't uh, understand. And I, it's it's like it, the thing is that it's also not a functioning watch. So right. it's only utility is to vanish a coin. And the people that are that are promoting the product are people who I know know many other ways to vanish a coin yeah, other than yeah. needing this very specific watch. And maybe the watch is great for, for some people, but I haven't handled it. But he, just watching the trailer, I was like, what? Like, why yeah, do you need so, this? So so in, many the group, other in the group we've been talking about, we keep using hashtag bracelet. Let's be honest. It's not a watch. If it doesn't yeah. tell time, it's not a watch. That's right? true. It's, yeah, it's a bracelet. That's a it's just a fancy bracelet. I don't care what you say. And it doesn't even look like it tells time, right? Like it's supposed to look glossy and black and that makes it look like a smartwatch. But even a smartwatch that doesn't ever come on or tell time, like, and, and yeah. who's supposed to buy this? Like kids that, that like people that don't have sleight of hand skills. So they're not professional performers and yeah. they walk to school with a new watch and all, and nobody's going to realize that their watch never works. Yeah, they're like, oh, if if they think that it's under your watch, take the watch <laughs> off and hand it to them, and then and then it's like, okay, well, what's step two when they realize that this is a fake watch? And they right, yeah. Right, right, yeah, right. Button it's doesn't so, work. They're like, oh, that's weird. It's so bizarre. Listen, Scotch Why and soda watch have a dead battery all day, every day. Scotch and soda meets watch might be the silliest product idea I've ever heard of, right? Yeah. Although I do have to say there's a, a guy in our group, and I, again, I won't give his name because I don't have permission. He does it, but he puts the coin in backwards. So now it's a comedy bit because it's not <laughs> in the watch. And then when he turns over at the end, the face of the watch is now the coin. It's the coin. That's Hilarious. actually funny. I think that's the way you use it, right? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like, so what you do is you do the vanish or whatever, and then you go, and I have no idea where it goes. And they're really freaking out. And you go, but eventually I find it, it just takes time. And now they see it there. And it's like, that's great. That's the way to use it, right? It's a comedy bit. It's a, yeah. But that's the other thing, right? The, the watch is also like plasticky and cheap because they're selling it for 
like 40 bucks. I don't know yeah, how they do it. Bucks. I don't know how they manufacture it for $40 and sell it, right? It's it's crazy. Yeah. It might be 50, but it's right around that point. Like, no, it's, it's, I remember seeing it, it's pretty cheap. I was yeah. like, wow, that's actually really cheap. Yeah. Um, so bizarre. Yeah. Lots it, of products uh, out there, like that, right? Right. And it's just, just frustrating. Um, but the one thing I will give uh, Illusionist props on that product is very clear in the demo video. They did make it clear as to what it was. So if you bought it, I think you yep. knew that you were buying a scotch and soda watch before you bought it. And and at least that's an honest game, right? Yep. Um, that, that seems to make sense, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I would say the same. I would agree with that because, I mean, we've watched some trailers and stuff for, for things to review and it's like, Oh, you know, 100% examinable. And then you were like, no, it's not. Right, right. Like, we know the gimmick. That is not examinable. Like, yeah. how, do you, how do you say 100%, you know? Well, like, the truth is, Ryan, you can say 100% examinable. You just, you just have to, with the idea that it's 100% examinable, 100% of people will find the gaff. But they yeah. can examine it. Yeah, yeah. Right? If they can look well, at yeah. it, they're not going to find the gaff. So that's the thing. It's like... The it is 100% examinable as long as you hand out 51 cards and not 52, right. you know, uh, and it's like, well, then no, then it's not, <laughs> you don't end clean. Oh, I'm, very, I'm like, very interested in our upcoming review on the product that we were both talking about. That's a deck yeah. where it yeah. says it's 100% examinable and we're like, no way. <laughs> yeah. it's examinable. But I mean, it. I mean, the, I'm I'm excited for that one too because it actually looks really. It looks really like it's awesome. an amazing effect. But yeah. just be be more transparent with. I mean, I don't know. Yes, you can have them examine something after you steal away or ditch the the stuff that they can't look at. You know, but um, would, yeah, would and, just like and, to and say, by the, the way, proper, when we, oh, sorry, what were we going to say, Brent? No, I was going to say, I think the proper phrasing for that is ends 100% examinable, right? If you add the word ends to it, yeah. then I sort of go, okay, I'll give you the justification that I do the trick and then to end it, I steal a piece off. As long as that piece is easily removable and it's stealable and it's hideable and it's not a giant thing that I have to sort of, then I can sort of, yeah. you know, and that's, we are talking about a little bit of minutia here is like what words we can use and how we can use them. But I think just just try to be honest with it. When they're just when they're showing at the end of the trailer, the thing just happened, and they go, "And it's one hundred percent examinable." You go, "No, these aren't. You didn't show <laughs> yeah. the steal." But yeah. if you do the same thing, but I see him steal before he does it, then maybe I'm okay with that. If it says ends one hundred percent examinable, it's just yeah, it's it's so tough right now. I would also like to say while that review was airing. The FPS coin wallet, if anybody looked at it at that point in time, it was not up on the site. I just want to let everybody know that now, if you are interested in purchasing the FPS coin wallet after you've heard all of our praise on this incredible product, then uh, you can just go to allaccessmagic.com slash shop, and it's right there for you. And our patrons have already been sent uh, separate posts on the Patreon page where they can get their 10 and 20% discount codes. So you guys are all set with that but yeah no there's definitely an insane amount of deceptive advertising in magic i think that sans minds for a while was kind of known and notorious for like yeah, like what it's... you see oh certainly not what you get i remember there was actually one product that was put out that involved black art and and i remember someone sent me a photo of the advertisement page and they were like Hey, zoom in. And they zoomed it on their phone and they were like, they photoshopped a black square over the entire table. Just so <laughs> you wouldn't see what the actual mechanism looked like because it does not look like that in person. But yeah, I mean, that's hilarious. It goes back to it goes back to that fickle nickel thing that, that was wrapped around his ear. During the entire tutorial, the guy keeps saying, I'm gonna show you the exposed angle. And he keeps saying that because there's only an exposed angle. Right? <laughs> Like the only time you see him doing an angle that isn't exposed is in the trailer. And I assume that's because they shot it 37 times until they got an angle that actually worked. But the majority yeah. of the time in the tutorial, he's saying, oh, I'll show you the exposed angle. And he's turning his body sideways so you can see the coin. But he's doing that because controlling a coin that's on three feet of thread between your fingers and your ear and hiding it in exactly the right place in your hand just isn't a thing that's easy to do. Even when you've got one lens looking at you, if you have three yeah. people looking at you, good luck. Like, I, I don't know how you're ever going to figure that out. But but yeah. it's like sort of, you know, it, you can just tell. The thing that I can tell is I can tell as soon as I look at a, at a tutorial on a product, I can tell if it's a trick that somebody created because they're using it in the real world or if it's something they created just to sell. And there's a yeah. huge difference between those two, right? And I also don't mean that you shouldn't buy presents, right? Because if you're going to film an Instagram video with it, 
know that you can shoot it 12 times and one of them will look beautiful. There's a time and a place for all that magic, right? Yep. Um, I just want to make sure my customer understands the time and the place. If you're not buying it for Instagram, but you're buying it because you want to do it in the cafeteria tomorrow, I don't want you to spend $30 on it and then get it and go, oh, I can't use this. I want you to understand you're not going to do it in the cafeteria between third and fourth period without looking like a moron. So don't waste your money, right? And that's the part yes. that really upsets me is that have kids that like mow lawns and work hard to save up 50 bucks to buy something that's just a lie. And I, it's like so frustrating to see a kid who's like, that's you know, right. and again, we take care of them, right? I just give them a refund and don't care, right? And then I call the manufacturer and go, hey, this is garbage. What are you doing, right? And we try yeah. to get right. And, and yeah. some of that, some of that and, and, you know, Craig Petty also does this really well because I think the more we sort of complain about it and the more we stop buying from those manufacturers, Sands Mines isn't a company anymore. Right. I think that happened for a reason. Eventually, we all just said, I'm not going to do it anymore. Right. I'm just not yeah. going to continue to buy a thing that is a lie. And as we do yeah. that, I think as a community, we can push out those those dishonest advertisers and, and hopefully make better magic. Right. All of us can come together and just stop buying a thing when it's I, I, right there. I, I think the crappy thing for Sans Minds was, uh, you know, obviously they had a ton of tricks that were only good for video. Like nothing looked like what it did, right? Sure. Uh, and then someone else bought the company over because I remember running into them at Magic Live uh, before COVID, and they were like, "I just bought Sands Mines. Uh, you know, that's not what we want to be about anymore. We want to bring out these quality products." Da 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 da. da. And, and but by that point, it was it was too late. It right. was like, well, you've you've lost everybody that was interested in your company sure. because, you know. So it's yeah, like, it's you might so as well. Bizarre. Again, I don't, I don't want to talk out of turn because I don't know who bought them, but it's so bizarre to buy a company that already has a failing business model, right? Like, why not just start yeah. your own company that, why be like, I'm going to buy. Well, he probably know, was able to buy it for like nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he might've, he might've worked with them and taken over or something. Sure, I, I don't know that relationship, but I know he was, he was telling me that he was taking away. over and I was like, <laughs> oh wow, you guys, it's a big hole to dig. Cause like you guys are known that like all of your trailers are lies. Like right. it's, it's bad, you know, yeah. like everybody, if you just go on Facebook, everybody just dis is disgruntled with something. Sure. So, um, I like but, Lindsay's uh, comment when we were talking about the watch earlier, saying, I yeah. recommend the showing of the watch method to prove the coin isn't under the watch. In fact, I want you to vanish the coin under a hundred dollar bill and also hand me the bill as proof. <laughs> That's <laughs> that that awesome. Way. Somebody so, posted it today and I, I forget who it was me and I wish I could remember, uh, uh, Somebody posted the problem with the watch that vanishes a coin is that it also doesn't tell you where cards are at in the stack. And you can't wear two watches because that's <laughs> way bizarre. That. That's, that's exactly what Blaze said to me. Uh, <laughs> did, you, did you see the follow up where they're like, so we printed the stack on the edge of the coin? Of course. It's yeah. so great. So now they have stack yeah. coin, which is a yeah. coin that has the stack printed on the edges. So you can still do. Uh, your memorized deck stuff and make the coin vanish at the end. <laughs> That's it. That's it. So, Bren, let me ask you this: as a, sure. uh, as a shop owner, was that always like your dream of owning a magic shop? No, no. The reason I own the magic shop currently is it's sort of uh, it's sort of a front for the magic firm, right? So, in the yeah. magic firm, uh, which is my consulting company, right? So I have a consulting company where I consult with magicians to help get them on Fool Us. I recently helped Dustin develop when America's Got Talent. So that's really what I do. In, 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 and that consulting company also creates all my products. So that's the magic firm. So they're the ones who are also creating the coin wallet and the card wallet and all those new products we've got coming out. Um, that's all through sort of the consulting process. And then we also consult for other people that want to make products so that we can make their products better. Um, and a lot of that's not even branded under the magic firm. We just work on a product and then silently make the product as good as possible before it goes to market. Uh, so the magic firm is all of that. And I've been bringing clients to town where I live, flying them in to sort of rehearse and block shows. And I was renting a photography space uh, where we go in the photography space when the photographer wasn't using it and we block the show in that space. And then one day I realized like, oh, I'm spending enough money right now renting this space that I could probably get a full-time space. And then the craziest thing happened. I'm thinking about this. And then one day I'm in a local restaurant and the mayor walks up to me and he's like, hey, do you come here often? I was like, yeah, I eat here fairly reasonably. Like, like, why? What's going on? And he's like, because I'm a customer of yours. And I'm like, oh, OK, uh, that's great that you like because I used to work at a home improvement store, like a building design center. I just think that's what he's talking about here in town. And he's like, I really like your tone restored thing. And I go, you do what? Yeah. Come to yeah. find out the mayor in our tiny town 
is like a magic enthusiast and buys downloads from Penguin and knows Penguin Magic. So he knows my torn restored card and he knows Position Impossible. And That's he's just awesome. like, and I was like, I was actually thinking about finding a space here in town and opening the space. And he's like, anything we can do to help you, let us know. And I'm like, how can I not? So I yeah. went home and wrote a business plan that involved first just the theater. Uh, we weren't going to have a magic shop. It was just going to be a 30 seat theater in town, preferably on a second story sort of loft so that rent would be cheap. And then I started to crunch the numbers and then I added the magic shop to it and a few other sort of streams of revenue. And I couldn't break the business plan, right? I kept saying, yep. well, what if we, you know, the one thing I didn't try to break it with though was global pandemic. <laughs> that was mm -hmm. the one thing I, I didn't leave in my business. Didn't plan. add in that? What? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not in the business. Obviously plan. not a mentalist. Uh, <laughs> exactly. magician. <laughs> So, uh, so then it just all worked out on paper and then I started looking for spaces. I found the space I'm currently in. It was amazing. Just so happened that I, I found it right before a place next door open, which is like a, a huge 20,000 square foot barcade with, you know, alcohol and, and a bunch of like 120 pinball machines in the basement and all the yes. old Mario Kart stuff. So I was like, this is the happening place to be. Let me yeah. open here before they open and my rent will still be reasonable. And then I can sort of ride on the back of them for, for at least, you know, three to four years. And that's what happened. So that's how we, it, I hate to say we opened it by accident. I'd, I'd run j &B Magic Shop. I started a magic shop when I was 20 and I ran that in malls and other spaces for about six years um, before I went back out of the, the world. So I like working at magic shops, mm. but it's really because it's where my creative juices exist, right? It's where, it's where I can be most creative when I'm hanging out with magicians. It's like when you go to that magic convention and you're there for three days and you come up with three crazy great ideas, right? Yeah. Um, that's what happens here, right? We just, I come up with three crazy great ideas because I'm constantly in front of people and I have a place to test. It's sort of like working the streets or working a restaurant. If I come up with a new yeah. idea, I can put it in front of 500 people very quickly to know if it's good or bad, right? Which means when I release a product, I know that it has value because I've seen it in front of a real audience for, for an extended period of time, you know? So it's, it was great. So it was all sort of a mistake, right? Um, yeah. but, but it, it worked out. <laughs> Cause now I have a theater to consult with the people in. I've got a magic shop out front where magicians come in to, to hang out. I've got everything I want. Right. Uh, also the magic shops only open four days a week. So it's not like I don't have, I don't have to have employees. I don't have employees. Right? It's just my wife and myself. It's a two person team. And that's the stuff I don't like dealing with. Right. That's why I don't want to be a huge distributor or a huge magic shop because I don't, I don't want to have 17 employees, right? Like I don't, yep. all that stuff just comes with problems for me. And right now we do, we do fairly well. And at, you know, we're feeding the kids and making a living, right? I love it. Nice. Yeah. What nice. percentage of your work is, is performing versus consulting? Do you do much performing anymore? Or is it pretty much all just working with other magicians, creating behind the scenes and, and de constantly developing new magic? Yeah, that's a great question. And one of the things that happened was when I, when I took, uh, uh, um, I took some time away from magic to go work for a day job. And then I started, that's when I started the magic firm, the consulting company. And I started consulting for other people and I was creating magic for them when I wasn't creating magic for myself. And it really taught me a thing that I think some consultants lack that really helped me. And that is it taught me to write in other people's voices. Mm -hmm. It taught me to watch you do a thing and watch the show and then not write my material and sell it to you or not write my material and hand it to you, but to write material specifically for you. And I could do that because I'd lost my voice. I wasn't performing, so I didn't have my voice. So instead, it was very easy for me to watch what you're doing and then write to you. So that three or four years that I was doing that just really sort of made me good at, at asking the questions to find out what you're really trying to do and what you're really trying to say, and then finding what jokes you think, are, what jokes will work for you, what lines will work for you, what blocking will work for you, what timing will work for you. Um, so that, that helped a lot. But right now, performing magic outside of the magic shop, outside of our theater, when we do things in here, I'm doing no gigs, right? I'm not doing any corporate work. I'm not, if somebody called me tomorrow and said, hey, we got a corporate gig we want done in Texas, I would send one of my consulting clients, right, to go do it because I know they're going to do a better job. I know they're going to be paid better. And I know I'm going to take a percentage of it for just sitting home that weekend, right? So it just makes sense for me. I, I don't perform that often. Now, I do still perform all the products that I create in the magic shop, out at bars, at conventions, you know, I would have done, you know, that coin wallet for a year and a half before I released it, which means I, I pulled a Sharpie out of that thing. I don't know, 22,000 times, 2,500 times. Like I pulled it out a lot to understand that crazy move. Like I can't yeah. explain how that thing works. Um, it just works. But, but 
right? So I'm still I'm still finding that sort of place. But even then, it's usually it's no longer me doing a show. It's me demonstrating a trick to get real time feedback. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah not yeah. doing a full not doing a full like I I I could do a twenty minute set. But if somebody called me tomorrow and said, hey, we want you to do an hour show, I wouldn't even know where to start. I, I just I wouldn't want to put together an hour show. I have no interest in it. Um, but I could crush 20 minutes pretty easy, right? Yep. Hmm. Yeah, it's almost like you're doing what comedians do when they're working out material before a show, but then there's just no show at the end of it. Yeah. Like yeah. you're just constantly trying things out, getting the audience reactions, really tailoring it, perfecting it. And then you're like, all right, moving on to the next thing yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 again until it's good. And that's what's nice about the consulting space, right? That's why this consulting space is here is because if you're going to pitch to fool us next year, I want to put you in in this theater, two shows Friday, two shows Saturday, and I want you to do that piece. I don't want it to be the first time you've ever done it is on television, right? And it's hard to do that in a lot of places. But, but because I'm sort of known in the community as the guy who works with these great acts and, and has helped win America's Got Talent and help get people on fool us, we can literally put a show in this theater where we tell everybody you're going to come see a 12 minute show. Um, it's free to come. You're going to come in, you're going to watch a 12 minute act and then we're going to kick you out and we'll book six of those. Right. So now we can come in and do that six times in a row, film every single take. But now at the end, when we sit down, we've just run proof of concept, right? Six mm -hmm. times that night. So now yeah. the timing is tighter. The joke is tighter. The line is tighter. It's all tighter because we've done it for real instead of just thinking about how it's going to work. Right. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I say all the time that magic isn't a thing until you, you share it with someone else, right? If you're in your bedroom and you're doing magic and no one's seeing it, it's not magic because magic happens in here, um, which means you don't know how people are. You can fantasize about how people are going to enjoy it, but you don't know until you actually show it to somebody and they go, oh, wasn't it just two cards? And you go, oh, uh, we're going to have to fix something here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 100%. That's the thing I like that you said earlier, uh, you know, I because we had Spidey on an episode not too long ago and Spidey said, you know, you can always tell when someone makes a trick uh, just to sell a trick or if they make the trick to to fit their performance, like uh, something that's needed. And and I love that because uh, I'm working on a product that, you know, I think needs to be better and I want it for my show. And then I'm like, oh, this is a product that I know a lot of mentalists will want. So, you know, eventually it might get sold. But um, <clears throat> but with Fool Us, we see that a lot of times, too, is you know that people are building that routine just for Fool Us, you know, and they haven't performed it a thousand times. So they don't know the ins and outs of it. And and I think a lot sometimes you can tell that on stage, you know, I mean, they've had some really great acts, but you can you can tell sometimes like, oh, that's. That's an interesting one. That's been done one time, you know, or yeah. oh, I, I definitely made that mistake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would have most certainly done an act that I had just like performed a million times, knew was was totally solid in front of audiences. But I was so excited about the methods that I was using and showing them to Penn and Teller that sure. I was like, all right, I'm going to just make this act. And it was the first time that I had really done that act. I mean, obviously, I'd rehearsed it a ton of times, but to get that proper audience feedback versus just guessing about how people are going to react to it is a very, very yeah, interesting and, challenge. And, yeah. and once we get into season five, six, seven of Fool Us, all the things that we do as workers are sort of taken, right? You can't, yeah. like, you know, you can't do Build to Impossible Location because that was done on season two. You can't do Cards Across because that was done on season three. At some point right now, we're in sort of this, this, weird part of the meta of the game show where almost everything you're going to see this year or a majority of what you're going to see was created specifically for the show because it has to be in order to stand yep. out from all the stuff that's been done right mm -hmm. we have to go in and say specifically we're going to do this trick and then we're going to write it for the show and either make it fit the sort of meta of the show or we have to write it to to sort of get attention in a different way but but if you send me your best very few people in the world are going to send me their best eight minutes tomorrow and that best eight minutes is going to be unique enough to go on this show after six seasons right it's usually going to feel like something that already exists there are a few exceptions to that rule but most of those exceptions have also already been on the show right mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah. I would say I mean, how many time. variations of pick a card are, are there? I mean, there's <laughs> definitely a million of them, but do, I mean, how many can feel different and not tangential or derivative at this point 
sure, like sure, I'm, sure. I'm interested to see if next season there's going to be any pick a card tricks allowed because well, there's been so many of them throughout the hundreds of episodes. Yeah, and there will be. You'll just have to be Spanish. That's the secret to getting on with cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah, it's yeah, true. Yeah. Right? Like, just, if you have a funny voice, need to go over there. Yeah. If, if you have a funny voice and you do Spanish style card magic, uh, then and it's a little set. bit easier. And it's just That's because funny. Caspian is trying to hit a demographic. And me doing a card trick looks like every other middle aged white guy in a suit who's done a card trick on the show. So they need yeah. some variety there. So if I was Spanish and I've been working in my accent, they haven't followed. Yeah. Me, but was, can we hear the? Can we hear the accent? Yeah. Have an accent and do the whole thing. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, yeah. So, so it's Throw on a wig and be a female Spanish magician for your there ass. Is. Yeah, then you will 100% totally do the same. So we have like last year I had five clients on the show and every single one of them was an original piece we'd written just for the show. Like think nice. about that. None of them yes. were doing their, their yeah. hundred thousand timer. Nobody was doing a trick that they'd done before. Almost every single person on that show was doing, uh, well, that's not true. Uh, Zach Mears did a trick that, that he's been doing for a while, but we changed the method. And we changed the presentation entirely, right? So it's not like he was doing it the way he'd done it a lot. Now, we still blocked it and rehearsed it a lot. So he performed it, you know, 30 times before he did it on the show, but yeah. not hundreds of times. It wasn't his A material. It was material that we spent time on the phone developing specifically for the show. Um, because you can't get on the show any other way. I mean, it's just really hard to get on without creating new material now, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bray says, I'm over here drinking blood. Uh, nope, nope, just water. Water. <laughs> just water. Just water just, with just just the, the red water. <laughs> now, I'm curious, Brent, what was the impetus for you taking a step away from magic? Was it feeling burnout or was it that you have a family and need to provide for them and make more money than a magician does? Uh, like, what was, what was the impetus for, for stepping away? And did you feel reinvigorated and re-inspired when you came back? Because I certainly, yeah. like, during the pandemic, took a bit of a step away and feel so much more excited and inspired and more confident with my magic since that. Yeah. So, so I had a magic shop open in a, in a mall and I was open there for, I'm not good with numbers, but four or five years. And, and that means I was running it myself. So I was in that mall 50 to 60 hours a week, right? Every day, except for maybe Sundays. I don't know, but we were, you know, I was in there a lot. Um, and we didn't have kids at the time. So it was like, that was my space. That's what, that's what I did. And it was amazing. Um, and then, uh, I moved the magic shop to a different location that wasn't in a mall so that I could sort of, uh, uh, be home more and figure things out there. And it just didn't work. So I had a huge financial loss in my second, my, I guess my third location, I had a huge financial loss. And I just walked away. I was like, I'm done with it. I don't want to develop anymore. So I took the next year off and, and developed and filmed. Uh, I, I essentially had been filming over that over those last couple of years, videos of me and uploading them to YouTube as unlisted videos. Hmm. So I had hundreds of my ideas uh, posted in these un unlisted videos. So then I created uh, Dex Lies and Videotape, a video notebook which is where I went through all those hundreds of ideas I had. I took 12 of them that I believed and I produced this video of me teaching those tricks, this DVD. And I self-produced all of it and it's horrible production quality. But this is around 2001 when nobody cared, right? 2000, that would have probably been yeah. produced in, two, I don't know, 2006, I don't know. I'm not good with uh, timelines again. But, but I produced that, it did really well, it sold well. And then uh, we got pregnant and I was like, I just don't wanna be on the road. I'm burnt out for magic, I don't wanna do it. Um, and I just left. I was, I, you know, I still had tons of friends for magic and I still talked to my friends and stuff. They'd still come over, but we didn't really do magic. I didn't really think about magic at all. Um, so then I just got a, a weird, a weird thing where I sent out my resume to a bunch of people and said, Hey, I might be looking for a job. And a buddy of mine called and said, you know, like, this is the guy you need to talk to. I just scheduled lunch with him. And I sat down with this guy who run this home improvement store. And he's like, I'm the sole independent owner. I do this. And I saw it as a, as a place to get an education, right? Because I knew my business was lacking. I just three years before this ran a magic shop into the ground because I made horrible business decisions, you know? Mm -hmm. So then I just went to work for somebody else to understand how to run a business. And after three or four years, I was the retail sales manager there. And I was like, you know, near the top of the company. And it was, I was just learning what it's like. The thing that that company taught me was how to look at things wide and deep. Before mm -hmm. that, I'd been thinking about how I was going to pay rent at the end of the month. And this, the owner of this company was talking about what we're going to do in 25 years. And I was like, I don't even understand that. Right. And, yeah. and now in consulting, I always say, well, you have to think three to five years because, because yesterday's gone and tomorrow's already gone. You can't change tomorrow. It's too late. So yeah. you have to mm -hmm. be thinking about what you're going to do in three to five years, because that we can, 
meet that trajectory and match that trajectory. But thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow is it's too late. You can't wake up and change your life tomorrow yeah. in, a, in a big way, right? You can wake up tomorrow and take steps to do it, but to really change it, it's going to take three to five years. And we talk about that all the time. And all that sort of comes from having worked for that other company. But then when I came back to magic, that was the unique thing because I left all of my material and I would still perform while we were out. Right. I just wasn't gigging as much. Um, yeah. And I was still doing, I wrote a, a, a sales training seminar that I was doing that had a little bit of magic in it. I mean, I mean, it was magic, but it, but it didn't feel like, you know, it was no heavy lifting. Right. It was like super easy to show up and I can do, it was more presentation than it was anything. Um, but then when I came back to magic, because I lost my voice, it was so easy to start consulting for other people. Mm. And it just, for me, it also, I, I, I by definition, in, enjoy solving problems. And it's great for me to solve a problem that I never even thought about. That's what I really enjoy. When Ryan comes to me and says, so I'm going to do a thing with ropes. And then at the end, it needs to turn into ducks. And I go, oh, I don't know why anybody would ever want to do that. But right. okay, let me figure out how. And those are the problems that I like solving. Right, because that's that's what I'm auditioning for Foolish with. Why did you let them know that? <laughs> Ropes to ducks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Right. It's original. That's the thing. Some, that's someone's gonna for. someone's gonna steal it now, though. I'm <laughs> some kind of pissed about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but so so it was a little bit. I mean, the real answer is we got pregnant. It was a little bit of burnout, and uh, it was a little bit of I I thought I'd failed in magic and just needed time away. I needed time to sort of let my brain exist and to educate my more myself more in business. Because the shop didn't fail because magic wasn't good. The shop failed because I was failing on the business side of things. So I needed an education, not in magic, but an education in, in business. Yeah. That's, that's really great, though, because I feel like, I mean, I've said it a ton of times. A lot of magicians have only ever done magic, right? And, and then they're not doing well in magic, and they're wondering why, right? And it's because they have no other life experience other than school and magic and then it's sure. like and and now with things like social media is like we need instant gratification right so it's like why am i not booking all of these gigs or why am i not getting the same gigs that guy's getting for you know ten thousand dollars and it's like sure. whoa whoa let's go back you know and so i i really appreciate i i'm gonna say this i'm gonna do this for this one let's oh, uh, you say oh right yeah, yeah, yeah okay well give me okay yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> gold nugget i'm gonna oh. say that's a gold nugget brent uh i'm gonna say oh, and only because you went outside of your comfort zone to educate yourself more to then become better at what you wanted to do uh you know which which i think is so important i think a lot of people don't do that you know um and it i mean I, i'm gonna say this we we have uh we've set up now with audible right uh, and both of us, I'm constantly like, oh, there's a new book I want to listen to and stuff because this person is better at business than I am. And sure. so hopefully I can take a gold nugget from them to make my business better. Uh, sure. And I find like so many magicians and actually one of our, our mutual friends, Denny uh, Corby, he was the guy that got me into Audible and he's like, read this book. And as soon as I did that, I was, you know, hooked. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it changed my life and how I think about things. And I thought I was already half decent at business. Uh, and you know, so well, I, I the, book, the book that you were talking about was your first one on audible, the third door, the third door. Yeah. Yeah. Great book. Uh, and i also, something that immediately popped into my mind with what Brent was talking about with the idea of mapping your life out three years out at least is so important. Um, and there's a book that I just finished. The most recent one that I finished on Audible was Vivid Visions by Cameron Harold. And it's uh, it's really, really great. And he talks about how he transformed so many different businesses being brought in as a business consultant. He also is the CEO of multiple businesses that are, you know, billion dollar companies. But he also was able to bring up the revenue a huge degree with different companies and allow them to set themselves apart by mapping <laughs> out where they wanted to be in three years. And that that's kind of like the same parameter that he always talks about is like, you have to make a vision for where you want to be three years out because he talks about um, a thing called uh, a B hack. He's like, you've got to have big, hairy, ambitious goals. Uh, I, I think is like what he talks about. Uh, and it's basically just the idea that it's so out there uh, that it seems almost impossible 
And, but once you have this very solidified vision of exactly where you want to be in life or where you want your business to be, then you can start working backwards and then implementing those steps on a day to day basis. And there was another guy, Brandon Turner, that I was listening to, and he was talking about um, the mins. So you have your you have your vivid vision and then you have your mins, which is what is your most important next step? And he kind of lives his life that way. Um, so, yeah, if people are interested in, uh, in checking out uh, Audible, we have uh, this site. You can go to audibletrial.com slash magic, help support the show. You get a free trial and you can listen to some incredible audiobooks. Are there any books that you've read or listened to recently, Brent, that you really liked? That felt really um, Not outside of the magic realm, really. Uh, so yeah. so most of that experience for me is now coming from from real world experience. right? Like So, so uh, there's a book in magic I've, I've read called A Book by Anton that's one of the best books I've written and read in the last three to five years, right? It's just really good at sort of changing my perspective on a lot of things. That's a, a magic book that is, has five or six tricks in it. I don't know how many, but it also has like theory, but the theory is not sort of based in, uh, in, uh, in theory essays. It's sort of based in here's the, way, the reason I do this trick. And I ask her name first because I need this information here. Like it's very practical information where you're like, Oh, I get. It. I understand that concept. It's not like you know strong magic where we're talking very deep concepts about never. Like it's very specific. This is the reason I'm making these decisions when I'm putting together these pieces, and it's inside of the the piece that makes it really good. Um, that's been one of my favorite books I've read recently. Mm. Uh, past that, no, it's it's for to step back a little bit. It amazes me how many people say I want to be or I am a professional magician, and when I ask them about a business plan, they don't have a written business plan. They don't have a written marketing plan and they don't even understand why they would want one or that it's a thing that even exists. Right. So like my thing uh, outside of that would be like, like go to your local SBA, a small business association or organization or whatever's near you and say, Hey, here's who I am and here's what I do. Who can I sit down with for free to help me write a business plan? And what they very quickly understand is that if you want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year being a magician, it's very easy to do math. You need to do one show, for a hundred thousand dollars, or you need to do a thousand shows for a hundred dollars. But when you tell them that, I think that they don't get that perspective, right? They've never even thought about, they've never even broken down how many shows they need to do a year at what price. And had they done that, the rate would go up immediately. When you realize, like, oh, I can only do a hundred shows a year and I want to make a hundred thousand dollars, I have to charge a thousand dollars for anything I do. And it's not mm -hmm. being cocky it's not being like you know there's some of these guys who go i don't leave the house for less than five thousand dollars it's not being that it's just that you have to know how many donuts you have to sell to to pay the bills at the bakery and yeah. it amazes yeah. me how many people don't put that work in right so most of the stuff that i've been in since we opened this brick and mortar shop for the last three years has been that writing business plans writing goals reestablishing goals and and sort of mud hands in experimentation on what does it really take marketing right like like but even then i've got a, a, like the other thing you'll find at the sba or the small business associations near you is somebody who works in marketing and really likes magic and now i sit down and actually have mentors in marketing right who who charge a lot of money to sit down and talk to the local bank but they sit down and talk to me for free and do the same thing over coffee because they like me and that's just local yeah. networking that's huge and that's what i've really fallen into um, in this small community space that we're in now, because it, it's just so helpful to have a banker and an attorney and a dry cleaner and a donut shop all in my sort of local bubble. So if I need anything, we can do, you know, we can do tricks and donuts here in the theater one night and my bakery will just sell me donuts for free because they know I'm going to promote their bakery. Right. And, and that sort of organization is what people I think I miss out on. But more importantly, just write a business plan, right? Go on to onto Google and type in, you know, uh, uh, templates for business plan and crunch the numbers and, and fill them out. And you'll quickly realize like, Oh, I'm never going to make a living. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right? Or, or if I want to make a living, here's how many shows I need to do. And here's what my rate needs to be. And that pushes you away from this sort of thinking of like, Oh, you want to book a magician? What's your budget? Like I, it's all sort of, for me, so antiquated, broken, you know, broken thinking to be like, I do shows for some people for $12,000 and then I do some shows for 120, right? Like for me, it's just a bizarre thought. I think that we actually have some disagreement on that. Oh yeah. <laughs> that's, an That's an interesting thing. Yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to 
kind of break that down because yeah. I think that in some instances, because Ryan and I have talked about that a lot recently, you know, with like corporate clients and, and the idea that like, well, obviously you're going to charge a totally different kind of amount depending on if, if it's a family friend that wants to book you for a birthday party versus, you know, a corporate client or something, but sure. um, establishing rates that obviously if corporates, if clients were to talk to each other, then it's not like you're giving them wildly, wildly different things. But also if you don't find out their budget, then are you missing out on, you know, on potential money that you could be you're leaving on the table, you know? So potentially, you know. potentially, but if your business plan is, is designed to make you $200,000 a year and you're meeting that by charging everybody $2,000 a show and doing a hundred shows, do you care that you may have left money on the table? Because the truth is, if it's about money on the table, don't buy Starbucks coffees twice a week. That's uh, what you're leaving on the table. If we're yeah. really going to crunch down to one specific thing, but I'm also telling you, you will get hung up where you charge. Now, now, let's be careful. Having that conversation with that client, I might find out what their needs are. And if they're doing a 20-year a, a anniversary and they want it to be big and special, I'm going to pitch a very specific thing that's off rate sheet but I'm going to give them more than they're paying for. I will pitch a thing. I'll say, here's rate sheet. I normally do this corporate event for this amount. But you know what would be great for you all is to add magic bingo. If you don't know what that is, let me pitch it to you. And then you pitch magic bingo to them and charge an extra amount of money for that because they're getting something special that's off sheet. I have no problem doing that because now if they talk to their other client, the other client goes, oh, they didn't charge us that much. And he goes, well, hey, did magic bingo for us. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. That's why he yeah. charged and now all of a sudden, at least I can justify those prices if anybody ever calls me back. Uh, what I have an issue with is making it hard on a customer, right? Like, when's the last time you bought anything and had to talk to someone on the phone? Right? It, it, it doesn't, like, I can't remember the last time I had to buy anything and actually had a conversation with somebody on the phone. Like, it's super bizarre. Um, which means if somebody has interest, I want to immediately send them a rate sheet and, and qualify them and book, like, you know, I have clients that are booking shows, like no contact shows. Here's the rate yeah. sheet, click the box, put in a deposit, and all of a sudden they get an email that said, you just got a deposit for this show, here's the date. Now, once they get that, they reach out, but there's no tension. They reach out and say, hey, uh, I saw you just booked this, I wanna confirm some details. That's where you can upsell to an additional thing if you want to, but I've always just been a, a fan that if your business plan works, you don't need to overcharge someone ever. Mm. I, it, yeah. it, to me, I can't think of another, I mean, there are other businesses that do it, but I wouldn't walk into a, into a, into a, a you know, a burger joint and the guy be like, oh, you got nice shoes. Burgers are $16 for you. Right. It feels sort of super weird to me. Mm. Um, and again, I, I know that there, there are people that are hugely successful with it. I, I totally yeah. agree. You know, I totally I, agree. I was going to say, I would agree and disagree at the same time. I know I a hundred percent understand. I do magic or mentalism full time for a living. Uh, and I, someone said to me the other day, do you have set prices? And I do have set prices, but I always want to have a phone call with my clients because my clients, I, I end up becoming friends with, sure. uh, and Spidey, Spidey is a guy who, you know, we, we disagree a lot on, on booking magic and stuff, but I was staying at his house and he heard me on the phone with one of my clients and said, I know why you do all your own phone calls and everything and why you hop on the phone instead of an email. He sure. said, you're incredible on the phone with these people. Um, and so I went through and just last year I would have missed out on $50,000 uh, if I didn't know what people's budget was and stuff. And, and I'm very transparent with people. Like, and I always tell them that I'm very transparent with my prices and here's what you want. You know, if, like one was for 1800 people a few weeks ago. And I'm like, okay. And, you know, and they said, you know, our budget is higher. So what, you know, what can you do? Uh, you know? And so we went above and beyond with the budget that way. But I saw, as I saw Bryce said, um, the question of what is your budget is a question that can come up later. If necessary, imagine if you went to a mechanic and they asked you what your budget is for getting your car fixed. I disagree with Bryce's comment. I because it's I would, necessarily the same. I, would, I don't think it's it's like going to a car dealership and wanting to buy a car. You're not going to fix a magician or a mentalist and say, we want a better one. So what's your price? Right. Uh, and people shop around with mechanics all the time. You know, you go to a mechanic and go, ah, this guy may not be trustworthy. Let me go and find another one. But if you go into a car dealership, you know, their job is to sell you, but you're buying, you're not buying the car, you're buying the salesman. And, and you have an in-person interaction with that person. 
that's the only way to buy a car, you know, unless you're buying it online or something like that. But you go to a dealership to deal with the salesperson. Uh, sure. And I, I worked in car sales for six, just for six months. And that's what they said all the time is people aren't buying the car, they're buying you. And if you are genuine with them and help them out and, and, you know, show them things that they didn't know, then, then that's great. But I, I would say, and, and price says yeah. service versus product, but, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, you are a product to that person because they are shopping around. Let's be honest. People go online now and go, oh, there's, I sent emails to 10 different magicians or mentalists, and I want to see who comes back with the best price and what they're willing to offer me. Right. So I, that's all I would say. I, I mean, yeah, I for think me, that there's for me, the, the for car both. dealership analogy sort of falls apart in that if you bought a car, right, if you bought the 2020 Lexus, right, uh, for $45,000 for me and loved it, and then your friend came in the next day and bought the same car, same mileage, and paid $15,000 less for it, how do I justify that, right? That's, that's the difference, which means all I want to do is say, you know what, uh, this is a $35,000 car, but I can get you cruise control and I can get you air conditioning. I can get you the stereo and I can get you, I can get you $20,000 worth more value and I'll only charge you 15. And now when you and I yeah. talk later, I go, man, I paid $20,000 less for mine. And you go, yeah, but mine's got undercarriage pinning and cruise control. And, and now the sudden it seems, seems oh. that way. Right? And yeah. Uh, I would 100% agree. You you always have to be upselling uh, yourself and making it special. And I always am making every show I try to do unique to that customer. So that if they ever said, oh, well, I had a friend that booked you and it was this much, right? It's like, well, but I did this for your friend or I did this or you guys are getting this, right? Uh, so I think that's important. Uh, and I, you know, I am always telling people. I should Every also show is custom. I should also so. mention that rate sheets never talk about, or, or the rate sheets I work with never talk about uh, hours, right? It's not like you're booking me for an hour. You're booking my, my, my low tech show, my medium tech show, or my full tech show. So yeah. if I'm going to be in front of 18 people, 1800 people, I need full tech requirements, which means I need lighting, I need sound, I need camera, I need screens, I need the whole thing. So that's yeah. why that show is more expensive because you're getting all this additional stuff. If you're doing a show for 50 people, uh, all you need is me. I don't even yeah. need a microphone. I have zero tech requirements. And that's sort of how it lists out on the rate sheet, right? So yeah. now you can immediately see the difference between a $1,000 show and a $3,500 show mm -hmm. because one of them, I just show up with a briefcase and do magic for 12 people or 50 people. Yeah. One of them, I show up and do, and, and that's maybe a 20-minute show, right? But if I'm going to do a full one-hour show at a tech conference in front of 7,000 people, of course, that's going to book for more than than me doing it for 50 people. Right. Um, yeah. so we're never really talking, we're talking about shows. We're not talking about hours yeah. and we're not, I, I would never advocate. I don't want listeners to, to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not ever saying you should book yourself for a thousand dollars an hour, regardless of what the gig is. Right. That's yeah. not what I'm saying at all. Yeah. Uh, I think that's where the scary thing comes the hourly in. rate really gets dangerous with clients because then, then there's the issue of division of that. They're going to look at your, your rate based on the amount of time and think, Oh, well, what if we were to just divide this and then pay yep. less and only get this? Um, I, I do believe in like when I when I send out um, emails related or I'm on the phone with a client uh, regarding a virtual show, then I do fluctuate the price depending on, on the amount of time. If they only need me for 50 minutes, 15 minutes versus 90 minutes in their in their event, then it's going to be a price difference because of my time investment. But if uh, I'm a big fan of when it comes to live, just setting an appearance fee and then, you know, and then obviously depending on if it's a stage show or if it's if it's walk around, then those are going to be different things. Things, but um, not not having it be something that could be easily divisible. I used to actually do this thing that was kind of ridiculous, and I've talked to Ryan about this. I used to for a while when I was gonna give when I gave prices. I always gave prices that ended in a five. That way they wouldn't <laughs> divide it. It would be That's just hilarious. like I would just That's end hilarious. it in a five. That way it's like they're not gonna go this in two fifty if they try to divide this in half. Yeah, one of the things that that uh, C.J. Johnson talks about, C.J. Johnson has a, a great book that talks about this called uh, More Money, More Shows, I think is what it's called. And one of the things that C.J. talks about is having your show in in an odd number, right? So instead of charging a thousand dollars, turn thirteen seventy five, because yeah, now it seems, exactly like extra, it seems like that extra three hundred seventy five dollars had to exist for a reason, right? You wouldn't yeah. just make up that number. You're like, oh, I took my cost and I divided it by something to come up with something. So now you're just less likely to get people who say. Because it's, it's like you were just talking about, please. It's like, 
I can easily cut it in half and go, well, what will you do for five hundred dollars? It's hard to do the math on thirteen seventy five, right? It's like exactly. what it's so yeah. confusing. what you can ask for. You know, it's really funny. It's really yeah. Funny. No, I I never had anybody after that ask about <laughs> dividing the price when I started ending it with like twenty five or ending it with seventy five. Because the I don't want to throw you fifty cents. It's confusing. Exactly. Right? Like, it's just so confusing. Yeah. It's just hilarious. Uh, I love it. Bryce had a good thing too. He said per head cost for stage show is an option versus the flat rate as well. If you want to charge more for bigger events, uh, it's a ticketed event show model, but the company is paying for everyone's admission. Uh, and I love that because, you know, I work with a lot of big companies that I, and I, some of them I have like really, really close relationships with where I know that they set their budget up with a dollar per head amount. And so sure. I'm just very honest with them. I say, sure. okay, we're going to do this event. What's your dollar per head? Sure, you know? sure. And well, and I and never go, I never say to them, I'm going to go at the top. I never sure. do that, you know, sure, because sure. I'm friends with them. I'm like, okay, well, can I fit in here? Yeah. And, and you know, and they're always like, yeah, hundred percent, let's do it. And a lot uh, of them are used to working that way, right? Because they're working with the caterer, right? And the caterer yep. is going to be 75. It also makes you sound a little less expensive, right? If they're going to be a yep. hundred people and they're charging $75 for every dry chicken meal, right? When you're 30 bucks, it seems like, Oh wow, that's a pretty good price. We paid 75, yep. 80, we paid 90 instead of saying no, it's three thousand dollars, right? It does help sort of divide that up a little bit easier for them, right? Yeah. But I do think yep. that that works in, in some applications. And the truth is, you know, I would never shame anybody. Like do whatever works for you, right? Yep. Um this is just what I'm finding is working in today's fast, high speed climate is you send a thing to a website, a client immediately sends you back a rate sheet and says, you know, here's what it is. Here's my phone number. If you want to schedule a call, let me know, we'll hop on a call. If you want to book right now, click this box and be done. And and Becky yeah. from accounting clicks the box and she's done. Now that client sure. immediately calls Becky to confirm and to upsell and to do all the things we would expect them to do. But, yeah. but, but, you know, it's nice to come home and have, have deposits in the bank for three shows when you didn't do anything. Right. It's just yeah. sort of happening. And, and also that, that for me, that happens a lot or that's working a lot with, with return clients. We've seen you already. We know what the contract works looks like. We know what the show looks like. All we want to do is have you come back. And that's just making it super easy for us to go click, 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 you know? Yeah. Now, here's the thing. So I had a client email me this afternoon. A uh, client I have never worked with. Um, they actually have a client that wants to book me. Uh, and I was driving. So I immediately called them. And I think it's even more special now. I mean, beforehand, yeah. before COVID, it was like, okay, yep, an email is great because yeah. like where everybody's used to seeing people. So I called this person and I said, hey, you know, I'm just driving right now. I saw an email come in uh, from you guys, um, you know, and I, I wanted to get back to you as soon as I could because I knew I had the podcast tonight and a bunch of work to do this afternoon. Uh, so let's just chat for a few minutes. And the, and the woman that I talked to on the phone was like, oh my goodness, I'm so appreciative of this phone call because I get to talk to you, right? Yeah. Where uh, I think now, especially nowadays, like at least I, I'm just coming from my experience uh, as well. Yeah. So I'm not saying anybody's right or wrong in this situation. Sure. But I know when I'm talking to the clients, they love that because it's like, you know, they're getting to know me over a phone call, whether instead of just looking at a photo on a computer screen, um, you know, and we were able to talk through this afternoon, like what the event is, you know, what it looked like and stuff. And, and you know, um, and I got a lot of information that now I can go back and go, OK, now I can sit down and write an email out where I'm targeting exactly what they told me on the phone call so that this makes the most sense for them. And I'm going to book this show. Sure. where, you know, someone else got that email today and went, okay, I'll email them back later, you know, uh, sure. where I instantaneously, as soon as that email came in, I was like, yep, I'm gonna hop on a phone call. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and like I said, they immediately were like, wow, that was so awesome that you called us like right away. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's, that's my yeah. job. So. And for me, we're, I think we're, again, I think we're closer on this than we think we are. Right. Cause again, in that original yeah. email where I'm sending them out a rate sheet, you're also saying a thing like, hey, if you want to hop on a call, I'd love to speak to you. Here's my number. I've got between yeah. three and seven o'clock today open. Let's let's not work this thing out. But here are all my details. And then they click on it. So even if they call, yeah. they sort of already are going like, oh, yeah, I think we're looking at like the thirty five hundred dollar show. But what's really the difference between that and the and the five thousand? And now all of a sudden, yeah. I know that I'm not because the other thing, Ryan, is I don't ever want to call somebody and go, oh, our budget's two hundred fifty dollars. I just wasted my, you know, like my resources yeah. and I don't have those resources. Yeah. So I think qualifying that sale and then 
then upselling or doing add-ons once you get on the phone is important. But I think we're, we're, we're closer oh, yeah, I don't together. Than- far off. I just think it's an no, interesting, interesting definitely. discussion, definitely, to hear the different perspectives on it. And um, yeah. yeah, that's that's definitely interesting. That It sounds like your priority is locking in as soon as possible that deposit, locking in that you have the gig, and then you can talk with them afterwards and then make sure that it's customized to them and see if they want to add any bonus features in. Whereas, uh, So you have a much more streamlined process to to getting the gig booked. Um, whereas it sounds like Ryan, you're, you're more about like acquiring as much information first. That way you can pitch them a tailored show that's to them, which probably helps you build a relationship and have them, you know, go, Oh, well, I that's, wanna, that's I, the only I, thing that I would, you know, you know. yeah, that's the only thing I would say is like, I mean, <laughs> learning from people that I I've talked to over the years, uh, and, and doing other businesses aside, uh, that's like, for me, the greatest thing, like I could book five shows a year and I wouldn't care as if my clients were really great clients that took care of me. Right. And like you said, you could book the one show for a hundred thousand dollars and be done for the year, or you could book a thousand shows for a hundred bucks. Right. But, uh, I've got clients where I go golfing with them. They, you know, they send me Christmas gifts and stuff, or, you know, like, uh, when I got married, I was like, oh, this client has to be at the wedding, you know? Uh, right. and it's like, well, because they're going to continue booking me for the next 10 years or 20 sure. years. And they're the ones that are going to tell friends sure. where I find a lot of times people, and, and I'm not ripping down the streamline. I, I just, I mean, I don't know. I just grew up in like a small community. So everybody knew everybody. Right. Sure. And so it's like, uh, you know, let's talk to the person. Let's hop on a phone call and stuff. So, um, I, I that's the me- part I like about it. Yeah, I guess for me that because because you're right with relationship building. That's the most important thing you can do in any of these is build relationships. Yeah. And for me, oh, that sort of happens more on the back end, right? So after I, after I've come out and I've done this show, then two weeks later you get a thank you basket of a photo and you and I together that's signed and it comes with a, a dozen brownies from the local bakery. Like that's sort of the the thing that we're doing on the back end, right? Yeah. Um, but it's important. Literal it's brownie also, points. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But every client has to, you have to care about and appreciate that they booked you and make sure that they understand you appreciated them. And I, yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. That is super, super important. And we're still doing that. We're just doing it in a late, slightly different way. Right. Yeah. I yeah. see that we have a few people that are listening in the discord stage. We have Ethan and we have Bob and Jim. We had Cedric, we had Chris. Um, if any of you want to call in and ask Brent any questions live, then feel free to just raise your hand and then I can add you into the call and we can have a, have a live discussion if you want to know. But I think that Bryce had an interesting point about how do you overcome a company wanting to talk about walk around magic in terms of hourly cost. Um, I mean, I could just throw out my answer for that really quick if you guys wanted to think about it. But like um, for me, if especially with walk around, I I immediately talk with the client. I ask them about the expected, expected, expected amount of people. And I just go honestly and realistic with them. I go like, you know, um, personally, uh, I'm not really satisfied unless everyone in the building has gotten to experience magic that night. And so I will go beyond the the uh, time limit naturally if necessary in order to make sure that i've entertained everyone but i think that we should just be realistic with the amount of time that i'm going to spend performing for everyone and uh and the uh, the uh, the amount of people that there are and how much time that's going to take if you only want me to do three minutes of magic per table and then i've got to run to the next table and do only three minutes and nobody can see any more than that because i've got to make sure everyone sees magic then yeah sure we can cram this into one hour but if you really want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to enjoy it then two hours would be i think more more appropriate you know and then i think when you discuss it with them honestly like that and you give them the context over the phone then that's something that's really tough to articulate over an email, but it takes 30 seconds to describe over the phone. And then you can make sure that you're booked in for the appropriate amount of time for the, for the situation, you know, and it's not necessarily just trying to upsell them on time. It's trying to make sure that you do the best possible job and people get the maximum amount of enjoyment out of it. So, so my favorite way to do that is to not charge hourly, but as you mentioned earlier, charge an appearance fee and then an hourly fee after that. So, right. So, and I don't call an appearance fee, but I just say the first hour is $1,200. Each additional hour after that's 200. If you want an hour, I'll show up for 1200 But if you want me to yep. stick around for two, I'll stick around for 1400 right? Because now all of a sudden it doesn't give them that leverage of, oh, you charge 300 an hour. I only want you for one hour, right? Yep. Here, come do it for $300. So I just say, this is my flat fee that I make for walk around. I make $1,200 to even show up at your gig. That's the first hour. Now, after that, hours are $300 an hour additional, right? So if you want me yep. to work 10 hours, I'll work all day. 
but you're paying me 1200 for the first one and then 300 for the next nine hours, right? Because yep. um, now they don't get the power of negotiation because that's what we're talking about is somebody who's cheap and wants to drill you down on price. No, I'll come up for an hour and do, I don't care if you've got 3,000 guests and I only do magic for 15 of them. If you're willing to pay me that $1,200, I'll show up for that $1,200, right? But it's just like an, an, a, minim, a minimum appearance fee. But I don't even talk about it that way. It's just on the rate sheet of $1,200 the first hour, $300 each additional hour. And now, yeah. no matter what, I know I'm making enough to go out to that gig. And and they don't call and try to, you know, divide the hours up and like make it make sense. They don't go, well, I wanted two hours. And if I add that, that would be 1500 But now I really only want one. So can I do 750 Like, they just can't get there because you've already overcome that objection by saying, for me to show up, here's the price, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I would agree with that 100%. That's all I used to do it all the time with that. Well, the, the gig I got called for today is a four hour walk around gig. Brutal. I'm like, for 60 what? people. Those are the worst, yeah. right? Like, yeah. No, it was, for 60 he, people, you're like, oh. oh. And I was like, uh, really? Like four hours? Because I asked, that was the first thing I said was, um, you know, do you want me for the full four hours? I saw in the email that your event is four hours long. And they were like, oh, yeah, we would love for the magic to last the whole thing. And I was like, how many people do you have there? You know, and they have about 250 people and stuff. But so I was like, oh, OK, maybe it could work, like depending on. And it's a big like conference place and stuff. So it, it might work out. But I have to put some numbers and stuff together because I was like four hours like that's you know you're getting kicked in the teeth after that yeah. like yeah, that's yeah. a that's a marathon the you most should... i've ever been paid for a gig i was uh booked for what was supposed to be three hours of walk around and then a stage set at the end for everyone and so come prepared for that i show up and it's the smallest oh. like <laughs> oyster bar in new york city and i find out that the restaurant itself only seats 14 people <laughs> and that there were 11 guests. So I was yeah. supposed to do three hours of walk around from one end of the table to the other end of the table. <laughs> that was my, and I'm performing for everyone the whole time. And it was like, oh my God, this is going to be a lot of material. Um, and that was, I mean, that was a fun time. They ended up it's just back on top again. It's back yeah. on top again. It's, it's back, back on top again. again. We're going to put it back in the middle. <laughs> the first time I did it, it was the slightly ambitious card. This right. time, it's more ambitious. And now we have the overly ambitious card. We do have Bob yeah. and Jim, um, uh, who's uh, just jumped in to call in. How are you doing? Is it Bob or Jim or uh, what? What should I? What's your name, man? Uh, so I'm actually Zach. Uh, Zach. Bob and Jim is play, uh, <laughs> playing video games on the internet. Name, that so. is amazing. Uh, just got really complicated. Cool. Welcome, yeah. welcome to the show, Zach. This is the man with three names. The What's man going on, Zach? Name is like Ricky Bobby. Okay. That's there you go. It's incidentally my uh, two grandfather's names, but I didn't realize oh, that when I came up with it in the uh, in the uh, seventh grade. Uh, my mother pointed out to me later on. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, but welcome to the show, Zach, Bob, and Jim. Uh, what was your What was your question for Brent? Yeah. So he mentioned earlier that he one of the most satisfying things about his job is getting to solve problems. Um, as an electrical engineer, I can really resonate with that. I would share a story of a time that you know a problem really irked him. You were cutting uh, but out he a eventually little bit. Can you, overcame can you it, and that? can you, you repeat know. that, Zach? Yeah, you oh, sort of broke. Hang off. Uh, Brent, you know you uh, you like solving problems. That's an important part of your business. Uh, can you speak to a time that a problem you really had to wrestle it with a lot, but it came out at the end, and you got that "oh, I did it" moment, you know? Yeah, for sure. There was uh, so at the end of uh, 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 America's Got Talent with Dustin Tavella for the for the semifinals, I think there was a situation where we we're going to make an envelope appear inside of one of the X's that gets brought down. And casting is not good about communicating. So we were like, hey, we need to see the X so that we can figure out how to get this envelope to appear inside of the X. And they were like, well, OK, you know, so we're in a crunch. We have five days to solve this problem. Right. Because once you get to semifinals, things start to move very fast. Right. You have 10 days to create the next thing and five days to create the next and three days to create the next or whatever. So uh, they sort of production kept putting us off and said, you can't look at the X. You can't look at the X. So we didn't end up getting on stage to look at the back of the X and have it brought down until like Sunday. And I think rehearsals, uh, video rehearsals were on Monday and Tuesday was the filming. And we had no idea what we were getting into. We had a great method for everything else, but we had no idea how to sort of solve this problem. 
And then when we got into the theater, uh, luckily I had sort of uh, brought Daniel Garcia onto the, onto the team, super incredible creator, super incredible thinker. And as soon as we got into that space, we had no idea what we were going to do. But as soon as we got in, we just both looked at each other. We got a ladder and like five minutes later, we'd solve the problem like instantly because, because all the things that, that we could do weren't possible. Right. When you get in there, the X doesn't come apart. It doesn't do any of the things. It doesn't have a way to change light bulbs. Like we were just pinned down in a corner and we had to figure out a way to do it. So we're like, we need duct tape and we need a piece of cardboard. And we need, <laughs> like, and next thing I know, we had this whole thing sort of built and it, it probably took 12 minutes to solve the problem. But in that situation, it was because there was only one solution. Right. Like once we got in the space, there was only one solution. And that solution was very obvious where sometimes I solve a problem and we have to kick around so many solutions and we have too much time to think about it. Uh, so, so sometimes I find that like, and it's weird, but I find that if you need a solution to a problem, a, an experiment you can do is to start a 20 minute timer and say, I need a solution in 20 minutes. What does that look like? And now all of a sudden it's a creative activity mm. to just believe that you need a solution in 20 minutes and then you'll get to a solution much faster because you have to get to one, which means you'll avoid some of the creative pitfalls of, of searching around. Um, now, once you do that and you have the solution in 20 minutes, it's not the best solution, but now you can step back and sort of widen that out and say, okay, why did I end up here? And what did I miss along the road, right? Um, yeah, I, I feel like there's a very vague answer because I didn't tell you how we solved the problem. But uh, <laughs> if you watch no, the episode, you'll see some- I am it. it's trade secrets, no problem. But... Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. But if you watch the episode, if you watch the- right there. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, you did tape. mention cardboard and duct tape. So, right. I mean, that, that's but that was literally the method. method. Yeah. <laughs> that's what you see on TV. It's yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that was really funny. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for your questions. Zach. If you have any, anything else that you'd like to ask before, uh, before I kick you out, then, <laughs> then uh, feel free to ask. The floor is yours. Uh, no, I pre appreciate you uh, bringing me in. Thanks for, thanks for the time, guys. Thanks, Zach. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. I mean, there was a lot of great comments while we were having the the discussion about, um, you know, just pricing and stuff like that. Uh, I, 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 think, grant. I think to end, to wrap up that discussion, Ryan, I think the important thing to do is figure out how much money you want to make, divide that by shows and have a cost, an average cost per show. It doesn't mean all shows yep. need to cost that much, but that's no, going to what's going to help you creating that business plan is the step that I see most magicians failing. When, when I have yep. people who've been doing this for two years and they come in and I go, how many shows are you expected to do next year? And they're like, I don't know. Like, I just hope some people call me. That's not yeah. working, right? No, uh, no, 100%. And, and, and I need you to be short of that number and, and so that you can go out and get aggressive towards that number, right? So you can change your marketing material and make sure that you're, you know, doing whatever you can to get those shows, right? Um, and then yeah. it also gives you a number where you can fall short or you can come in heavy, but now you can you can budget for next year, right? You can say, okay, yeah. next year, I didn't do as many shows as I want, which means I'm going to raise my price next year, which sounds counterintuitive, but that's how supply and demand works. That's how you're going to make money. If you, you have to believe that the product's good and the product has value, but if you believe those things and you say you're going to do a hundred shows for a thousand dollars and you only need to do, and you only do 75, I'm telling you to raise your right to 1400 or raise your rate to 1400 because yeah. now you're going to meet your business model, right? Yeah. Um, it, it just makes sense. And that's the direction. I think too many magicians aren't thinking about that and they're not thinking about a marketing plan at all. Write a business I mean, plan, write a marketing plan for sure. I'm going 45,000 a show this year, just so that I can. It's got a book too. Just got to hit, just got to hit that goal. No, uh, no, I think that's really great. And I mean, uh, yeah. And I would say that too. And as you become more experienced, I think you should also start raising your price as well. Uh, because you know, uh, there's a lot of people that come into magic and are like, oh, okay, this is the price I'm going to set and stuff. And it's then, you know, then when we're talking about the car stuff, it's okay. Are you buying a BMW or a Lamborghini or are you buying, you know, the Honda Civic, you know? Sure, uh, sure. So and how do you it, upgrade yourself from Honda Civic to Lamborghini level? You know, that's, yeah. that's what I was just about to touch on, right? Here's the thing. The number one thing I think people are missing about rate is promo material, right? Mm -hmm great promo material, right? Like pay somebody a lot of money to take photos of you, pay somebody yeah. a lot of money to make a promo video of you. You know, I see all these, all these people that are out doing these shows and they're filming 
from the back of the comedy club with their iPhone and it's blown yeah. up video and it looks awful. And those are the people that I know are going out for, you know, a third, a quarter of what they could be going out for because they're yep. good at what they do. They're just not investing in it. And that's part of the business plan, right? So let's talk about this $100,000 business plan that we've created. We're going to do 100 shows. We're going to do about $1,000. We're also going to put 30% of our income straight into a marketing plan. That's how a business plan works. That means next year I'm going to have $30,000 to spend on marketing. And why is that important? That's important because at the end of the year, if I've only spent 15000 and I still have 15000 in my marketing plan, it is easy for me to book a, a video shoot for $8,000 because I know I have that money earmarked for that in order to make sure I continue to go. It's hard yep. to pay you know, $3,000 to get a good photographer to take photos of you. But when you know you have that money earmarked in the business plan and you're sticking to the business plan, you know you have to earmark that money to do something, to do SEO, to do new photos, to do new video. And you no longer feel guilty about doing those things. You're no longer using a promo video that's that's five years old, right? Yep. Um, you're using a promo video that you made this year because you are putting that money to the side. And and when you write that business plan, it will explain all of those things to you, right? You'll, you'll very quickly go, and maybe 30% is too high. In the beginning of business, I don't think it's too high, right? Right now, I spend about 8% in my marketing plan, um, but we're years into this thing. And as you get years into it, and you're already sort of flying the way you want to fly, you can reduce that. But year one, I want to do magic professionally. Every time you do a $1,000 show, you should put $300 into marketing in some way. Um, and then very quickly, you'll be able to upgrade that game of promo, of website, of all the things that prospective customers are seeing that, to be honest, I would say eight out of 10 magicians' websites look awful. Their promo looks awful, yeah. right? It just yeah. doesn't look good. So as soon as you step it up, man, it's so much easier. For somebody who's playing a serious game to see the difference between booking you for $3,600 and booking that other guy who has crappy video for $1,200. It's like not even, it's not even the same thing at all. That is the Corolla versus Lamborghini scenario. That's yep. it. Shiny rims. That's the only yep. damn difference. They both get you where you're going. And the truth is the Corolla is probably a better car because it's more <laughs> like more efficient on fuel. And in the long run, it's like more roomy headroom. Like it's easier to get out of. The truth is the Corolla is probably the better product. Like dollar for dollar, it's probably a much better buy. But boy, is that new Ferrari Lamborghini shiny, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know? 100%. Like, oh, yeah. Absolutely. 100%. There are. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there was a couple other comments that came yeah, in. Actually, I mean, Tiger asked earlier was about um, have you guys ever performed and had someone give you a tip all the time? And actually, yeah. I've been, I've been personally lucky in that throughout my magic career, that's been kind of a a um, a stepping stone for being able to increase rate. As I've had clients that have been generous enough to go, I'm going and it's flat out tell me I'm going to pay you this much more, and you should start charging more from now on. And so then that's just continually happened. And so I've then raised my rate at that point and been like, okay, I guess I, you know, deserve to be charging more than this. Also, it's very arbitrary. I mean, like, you know, what, what your rate is. It's, it, I mean, like if you, if you set yourself in a certain price range, it's kind of like, it, it's really whatever, whatever price you give is what you deserve, you know, at that point. I mean, obviously if you're inexperienced, you shouldn't be, you know, um, you shouldn't be charging a ridiculous amount, but it's also like, you know, it's so arbitrary because you'll see that a lot of the people that are making the most money in magic aren't necessarily the best magicians. They're just the people that had the courage to add a zero to their price tag. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and usually have a, a good suit and great promo, right? That's the, yeah. that's the Lamborghini, right? They're not a guy wearing a $200 suit when they show up. They're not a guy who's got promo videos that were filmed from the back of the theater, right? It's very easy for us to spot somebody successfully by looking at their suit. It's very easy to understand yep. somebody who's successful by looking at their venue. I, I, the other thing we should talk about in promo videos in general is that it don't film Instagram magic in a promo video. If you want to look like an Instagram kid, great. Show me a bunch of visual things. But then I immediately go, oh, my nephew does magic too. He has those to camera shots. And I'm not yeah. saying you can't do one or two B-roll camera shots. But what you really want to do is show people, guests, having a good time. Way yeah. more than we want to, we don't want it to be about you. We don't be like, uh, and again, these are things that a marketing plan and the local person that that works near or in, in conjunction with your small business administration or association, they can immediately tell you, right? Don't yeah. ever play to camera, 
right? But but that's all based on your sort of uh, marketing archetype and 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 you know a bad boy will look at the camera, but just at the end to give it a little wink and a nudge. Um, like it just depends on your character, how you play to the camera. But the truth is, nobody booking you cares about you, right? Rarely, rarely. I, I, in some situations, yeah. rebooking do, but in general, we have to assume that what they care about is their guests, their attendees having a great time, and that's what we need to sell. We don't need to sell you doing a snap change because I can see that on Instagram every time I turn on my TV, right? Every time I turn on yeah. the, my uh, my thing, you know. Yeah, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. And that's it. Like even uh, I said, I had <laughs> I had booked like uh, so many things before COVID for uh, film crew to come to all of my gigs uh, for the year, and then COVID hit, and it's like, oh, cancel all of those gigs. Um, but it's important to just get more and more footage of things, uh, and like you said, high quality footage and stuff. So it's yeah, it's and and that takes point. time and effort because, as I said, yep. you want to show guests genuinely having a great time, and you'll do a great show for some company, and you'll you'll get permission to have somebody come out and film it, and it'll be great. But you won't get those reactions you get sometimes. So yep. then you're going to have to do three or four of those film shoots to sort of to sort of get it done. And what we've done a lot at the Magic Firm is to to uh, uh, like it's cheating, but it's part of our job and responsibility. So we rent a theater specifically to do this. We sell tickets to the show to 200 people. And then the guests that we use in the show, we pre-select them in the lobby. They've not seen the show before, but we pre-select them in the lobby and say, would you be interested in being in the show? We have that opportunity tonight. But if you say yes, I'm gonna need you to stick around for an hour and a half after the show to spend some time with our magician filming some additional spots. Is that okay? And they say yes, and then we sign it up. So now we have 20 people in the audience who've signed these things. The magician backstage knows who those people are. He decides which ones he wants to use. So when he brings Becca up and she reacts and loves it, the first time we film live, all we wanna get is Rebecca's action, right? We wanna get her freaking out. Now we're gonna have her stick around and we're gonna do pickup shots over his shoulder, over her shoulder, for cameras that aren't even there so that we can tell the narrative of what just happened for Rebecca. We're yep. never going to say to Rebecca the second time, act like you did the first time. And we're never going to say, act like you're freaking out. We're going to get the genuine reactions the first time we film. The second time we film, it's just to tell the narrative about Rebecca coming on stage and Rebecca having this moment where an example of that would be SpongeBob. So we have a wide shot of Rebecca opening her hand and a hundred SpongeBob's fall everywhere. And we get a big smile from it. It looks amazing. Yep. I want a close up of her opening her hands so that we can go wide shot tight shot to her hands opening wide shot to the balls falling everywhere and Rebecca freaking out. And when you do that in a punch, 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 I'm telling you guys, this sells shows, right? Because yep. everybody goes, I want my sister to act that way. I want Becky in accounting to act that way. I want somebody to freak out the way she just freaked out. Right. Um, 100%. And it's sort of in a way it's cheating, but because we're getting the reactions first, I don't, I don't consider those pickup shots cheating, but it allows yeah. you to get, Another example would be like doing position impossible, right? Where you've got a deck of cards spread on a table. There's a lot of pickup shots that I want to look amazing and I can cheat those pickup shots, right? Because in the, in the video, uh, it, position impossible for those that don't know is a card at number of mine and it uses a mispipped card. So you have to hide that. And in the pickup shot, I can hold it this way because she already knows the trick's over. And we just go during the show, you picked a two of clubs. So we're just not going to even do that part. I'm just going to hold the two of clubs up and we're going to get this wide shot. So there's some cheating we can do too, right? Um, but it's because all I'm concerned about is selling the narrative to the client of what the experience was like if they were there, you know? Yep. Yeah. And then yeah. I take that pickup shot and I turn it into a magic trailer and I lie to people and sell the trick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lie to That's people. That's a good callback. That's a good callback. That's a callback. Then we lie. Um, yeah, Albert, speaking of that, uh, Albert asked a question. Have any of you guys... That's exactly what I was going to pull up. <laughs> So did it automatically raise your rates? The people booking us for gigs are not the people buying trick of the year. Like those are just very different things. Uh, yeah. Usually like if, if, if someone's buying your magic product, that's not usually a client. It's very rare that that would be the case. Yeah. Uh, and it was actually interesting because, uh, oh, uh, Ethan had a great question as well that said, uh, how do you go about raising prices to places that you have an ongoing residency with? I mean, if you have a residency, I mean, hopefully every year or, you know, every once in a while you're talking to the to the to the owner of the establishment uh, to, you know, as inflation goes up in the world as well, like inflation went up a crazy amount in the last two years. Right. So for you to be able to survive, your prices have to go up 
uh, with inflation uh, and stuff. So I, I have a client that I work with that's a NASCAR team. Uh, and they booked me through someone else the first time because that person didn't want to drive to their location. And I said, sure, I'll do it. And that person then called the, the guy the next year and said, we don't want you. We want Ryan. <laughs> But, you can say my name, Ryan. I'm right. Yeah. Here. Okay. They didn't want Brent. I'm um, really Brent did not want to drive. He was like <laughs> mechanics and stuff. I don't want to see those guys. Uh, but it was a NASCAR shop, so it's the cleanest. is cleaner than anybody. One of those mechanics. They asked me my budget first before they. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They did. Yeah. Because uh, they only work on expensive cars. Uh, but uh, so uh, I went, and you know, uh, so I did their show for the same price for three years even though my price had gone up, but they were also a, a, a team that said, Hey, I said, you know, now that you've seen what I do, I'd love to see what you guys do for a living. And they said, sure. Why don't you come out to a NASCAR race? Well, you know, put me up, took me out everywhere. I had lunch with the team and everything. And it was great. The three years go by and they, they booked me six years in a row. And so the next time uh, they go to book me, I raised my price 500 bucks. And they said, Whoa, Hey, we, uh, we just noticed that your price went up and I said, my price went up three years ago, but I never, I never updated you guys because you're a great client of mine, but if you still want me and, and you know, they were like, of course, of course, we're going to book you for that. And cause they know their price has gone up on things to rent a car from the NASCAR team has gone up every single year, sure. you know? Sure. So I think anybody that's doing business understands that prices go up. Uh, and if you're in a residency situation, then it's something that you should be open and transparent with the person that's running the residency or running the building so yeah. that they know, hey, you know, eventually ticket prices might have to go up or my cut is going to have to be a little bit more. Yeah. So I have an interesting secret to this that I also think plays into rate sheets. And that is that the rate sheet says fall 2021. Yeah. So when yep. you book me and at the bottom, it says rate sheet or at the top, it says fall 2021. When you book me the first time, you expect winter to be more. You expect January and February, like spring to be. The fact that it's a 2020 rate sheet somewhere on there, a 2021 rate sheet, tells you that my rates do fluctuate and do change, right? Yep. And I think that just helps you. So when, when they send me and they book me and they go, oh, we booked you last year for this price. And you're like, oh, yeah, but here's my new rate sheet. And then I hold them over for a year. They feel grateful to me when I say, oh, my price went up. And I said, you know what? This year I can hold you guys over, but next year I'm going to have to raise you. big And they're like, oh, we appreciate that. And you'll yeah. even get people that go, we appreciate that. But no, no, we want to pay you. We want to pay you full yep. rate. If your rate get up, we get it. And we understand that, yes. right? That's, that's exactly the, the NASCAR driver, like the team, they were like, as soon as I said my price went up three years ago, but I enjoy working with you guys so much that I've left sure. my price the same. You're the hero. You guys. They were like, oh my goodness. Okay, no problem. Yeah. And you know, never bat an eye about the extra, you know, extra money, right? Yeah. And and so. and when he's asking about uh, about a residency, that also scares me because it depends on if it's a restaurant residency, residency a hotel. It depends on what you're doing. Yeah. Because some of that, I think, is about raising your rate by proving value, right? Yeah. It's a value proposition. And if it's a restaurant that you're doing on a Wednesday night, and when you started, they had 15 people coming in, but now they're advertising a magician and they're getting 60 people coming in. Those are very easy ways to, to justify your increase in rates and to explain to them exactly what's happened, right? If you can justify yeah. the value, that's even a better way to justify the rate. But usually that's in a restaurant gig, a hotel gig, something where they are seeing bar traffic increase by 30%. They are seeing yeah. And that's also things that if you're, and, and I know Mike Eaton has some systems that allow you to do this. I've not used any of them, but systems that allow you to track revenue and track how many people are coming in because people bring in coupons and they collect those and then it you know does some stuff. There are ways to sort of track what that is if it's yep. that sort of gig. But the important thing is even if you're not even if nothing's tracking it, if you can just say, look, when I was coming in here originally there were 20 people a night coming in and now I was here Thursday, I counted 75, right? And and that's because of me. They, it's easy to justify that that increase, right? Because the value is there, right? Yeah, 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 and and if obviously it's different with that kind of walk around setting, but like if sure. if the material that you're doing evolves to a certain extent where you're you're not just doing the exact same show every single time that they book you, then you can also justify it that way, where it's like you know I've okay. invested in research and development to continually improve what I'm what I'm you know performing for you, so it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, for sure. 
You could be like, see this wrist, ba- this, see this bracelet I'm wearing? It makes coins. <laughs> see this bucks. I'm wearing? Like, this is somebody's got to pay for this bracelet. You couldn't vanish yeah. a coin this clean before. <laughs> Look, you can examine it. Look at it. You want to hold on to my watch? You <laughs> could keep it. On. You could keep no, it because you're going to pay me so money. much. I'm going to just replace the $40 watch. <laughs> <laughs> you can keep the watch. That might be the best use for the watch ever. You yeah, use it and then a, you hand it out because it's so it's inexpensive. It's a souvenir. And you can it's keep a souvenir. it. Yeah. I'm going to buy a thousand of them tomorrow. <laughs> it's it. like Cuban bottle, but it's coin and watch. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> it's a souvenir. Now, I think it's time that we find out a little bit more about bread. Yeah, definitely. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that time. It's time for 20 questions. It's time for 20 questions. Yay. It's time for 20 questions. It's time for 20 questions. Yay. Put two minutes on the clock. There's been some great comments while that that was going up. You want to read? I gotta I gotta bring up one. Uh, Albert says my son was a magician at five. He would tell my wife to pull a surprise from his pocket, and every time she touched the live frog in his pocket, she freaked. <laughs> that that is a trick that every magician that's doing walk around magic should be doing. Uh, that's just, how you raise your price. You yeah. walk into the client, you go touch my pocket. I mean, that is dedication to carry a frog around in your pocket. So, Albert, that, Albert, uh, that's the comment of the night. I'm yeah, sorry. Albert. Everybody else, comment of the night. Albert's uh, <laughs> five-year-old son carrying a frog around. Uh, <laughs> that's real magic. Yeah. Terror in a pocket. That's it. So, Brent, uh, how this works is we are going to ask you 20 rapid-fire questions. Oh, I'm so uh, bad. We where we love honest, truthful answers. We have some people that when we say like, "Who's your uh, favorite magician?" they'll just say you, and stuff like that. So uh, honest, uh, honest answers, uh, yeah. and we'll see uh, how many we can get. We're gonna go back and forth between each other. So, uh, are you ready? I'm loosening up. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. I'm telling you, I'm gonna be bad at it, but we'll go. All right, here we go. Dream vacation destination. Uh, Seattle. Biggest pet peeve? Um, people that pass and then shuffle. Biggest mistake during a performance? Uh, I, so I did a, a bottle production outside at a stage event, uh, opened up the soda, it had shook because it dropped on the ground right before I produced it, uh, shot blue soda all over the stage. It took an hour for events to clean up the mess. It was awful. It's sticky, gross. <laughs> it was bad, bad, bad. That's gross. What always makes you laugh? Um, chat along. Uh, secret talent. Oh, secret talent. Wow. I don't know that one. Uh, can we pass and come back to it? How's that work? You come back. Sure. First time you ever saw a magic trick. Uh, uh, David Copperfield, uh, Crazy Man's Handcuffs on television. First memorable if you, one. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Um, I, uh, man, uh, it's got to be invisibility, right? As a consultant, Dream. think of all the things I could do with that. <laughs> yeah. Dream <laughs> performance venue. Uh, my own theater. I mean, I love it, right? I get to do what I want. Most cherished memory. Uh, this it, Because we're on a magic show, I have to say the moment in, in and of itself. If you guys haven't seen the film, watch the yep. film. Uh, there's a moment in there that changed my entire life. Favorite food? Uh, let's go with impossible to answer, but I would go with sushi. Uh, favorite movie? Oh... Uh, again, cheesy answer, but I'm going to go with The Princess Bride. What's the worst job you ever had? Uh, so I worked for a uh, cigarette company for uh, about six hours, packing boxes of cigarettes into a semi. So they don't load them on skids. They hand pack them. And you have to carry a, a carton, like not a carton, but a case of cigarettes down an 80-foot trailer and stack it up. And the problem is once you've done like three rows – the whole place stinks of tobacco and you stink of tobacco and I vomited and I left half the shift and my day was over. Nice. That is amazing. Horrible. That's that a good one. Oh my gosh. I like, I, I, I appreciate the amount of details. However, yeah. that was probably the least amount of questions we've ever gotten through. in the. Uh, oh, you know, you know what? The, the 20 questions, the, we only got through uh, 12. Actually oh, the worst than him was Chris Kenner. 
Uh, Chris, 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 was Chris race, last right. week, he only got 11. Man. Uh, but you and Chris, back-to-back weeks are, uh, you know, lunch bag letdowns. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Do we have any good questions left and we can do a bonus round or something? We that's what we did with Chris. We said let's do a bonus round here. Right? I don't know how Wait, 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 wait. He only made it through 11. We had a skip. We had a pass, remember? Oh, we had oh, a pass. Yeah. Oh, so you tied, tied with Chris, Chris Kenner for last week. Oh, that's no good. Boy. I mean, that's yeah, not that's a pretty good leaderboard though. I mean, that's, that's Yeah, good. I mean. Was it did I answer slow or did I, I was just too detailed? I think there might have been a mix a little bit of both little in little. some in some in some things uh, some somewhere. of them like what always makes you laugh you were right on it with chad long you know so, oh yeah. my gosh but so there's a couple that were a little bit longer hesitation yeah yeah and then i explained them too which wasn't good like the whole this is why i can't be on a game show but the yeah. tobacco yeah. i'm happy that you told us the story with that like that's that's crazy that you only worked for them for six hours <laughs> yeah yeah it was, it was like the worst like it, that was the one like i was 19 maybe 18 i don't know how old i was maybe 17 but it was like the first experience that i realized like i'm not cut out for this day labor shit right like it's yeah. not <laughs> it's not in me to carry things into a semi and walk back and forth while carrying because i also don't smoke and like mm. just, just tobacco smells even when it's in cases it just smells yeah super disgusting so the other thing i didn't talk about because i was trying to shorten the thing is the first thing they do is take a giant plastic bag that's as long as the trailer and they inflate it into the trailer so that you're walking into a giant plastic bag and they do that because at the end they tie it off to keep the cigarettes from getting stale right think about it like a giant 80 foot long bread bag Mm -hmm. so you're walking into this giant like (laughs) musty cigarette scented sweaty gross and then they also pay you per trailer. They don't pay you an hourly rate. So mm-hmm. they paid you like 60 bucks a trailer. Good guys would do four of them in a shift. I think I did a quarter of one in my six hour shift before I quit. <laughs> horrible, horrible job. Never do yeah, it. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sound like fun. It was, it was, it was literally the day when I was like, I can't do this, you know? Yeah. That's, um, that's yeah. when you started doing magic. Exactly. <laughs> Forget this. Um, I mean, I think another great question is, what's your most highly recommended magic product or book? Uh, product, I, I mean, as much as it's overdone, I don't care. I would have to go with with uh, um, Double Cross. I mean, I know it's overdone, man, but like pound for pound, punch for punch, man. When you do that properly, it's hard to, to just not give people memories forever, right? When you do it properly and they know they were never touched before the thing happens, Man, it, it just creates such a such a strong memory. I uh, stopped books. doing it because I was pissed at how strong it was. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I don't like that this is just, this is the thing that everybody remembers more than everything else so much, you know. <laughs> oh, did we oh, lose Brent? Uh oh. There and back. Oh, there we go. Oh, there, yeah. we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. He so, couldn't stand, he, your, yeah, your connection couldn't handle me dissing it at double cross. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm not listening to you anymore. Freeze. I hung up. I hung up. As soon as Blaze is like double cross, I'm out, I'm out, I'm done. Yeah, nope. That's it. Nope. He's um, like, I don't perform it. Block. And, and book was uh, uh Maximum Entertainment. Hmm. It's been I, a, that's been a big choice for sure. Yeah. I tell people all the time people. that one of the things that I do in in consulting uh, is just tell people what maximum entertainment says. That's yeah. a lot of my job <laughs> is just saying, no, do this. And all I'm really doing is quoting chapter seven of maximum entertainment. <laughs> yeah. I got it over there and I still haven't read it. That's really bad. I need to check out no, chapter no, seven right after this podcast. From a, from a, from a theatrical magic standpoint, it also is a book that I think if you're performing professionally, you should probably read it, read it at least once a year, maybe twice a year because it meets you where you're at which means the first time you go through, you'll skip the stuff on microphones because you're like, oh, I'm not using that. Yeah. But then when you come back to it two years later, you'll be like, oh, that's why I should be using that, right? Mm-hmm. There are a lot of chapters that the first time you skip through, you'll get hit heavy with some chapters on scripting or on on a voice and you'll skip and you won't get anything from the rest. But the second time you read it, another thing will jump out and you'll be like, oh, how did I overlook that the first time, right? So it sort of changes yeah. the perspective every time you read it. And I'm telling you, like literally um, is, is so good, especially for people who are trying to make that, that jump from close up magic to parlor or stage. If you're trying to make that jump, I think it's a huge, huge book that way because in close up, I can be too fast and I can move around and I can be very in that. But as soon as I move on to, on the parlor or stage, I have to own that stage. I have to lock my feet in place 
I have to yeah. control that space in a way that you don't have to control a close uh, thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I see a lot of people miss out on, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great book. Yeah, I need to I need to get on reading that. I think Colin Cloud also was uh, was recommending he it very very. I think there's been a couple of guys that have have said that as their. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and again, like we, you know, there are great books out there on tricks. We just don't we don't need more tricks, right? Like you got yeah. everybody listening to this probably has enough tricks, right? Except unless it's like an FPS wallet, in in you know black or brown. Yeah, yeah if you don't own an FPS coin wallet, if you don't know that, you yeah. need that. Yeah. That's actually how. That's actually how I justify my rate increase. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys see what I brought out this year? Thousand uh, dollars more. I just I just pull a sharpie out of it, and they're like, "How do you justify yeah. the extra three hundred dollars you want to charge us?" And I go, "Look, that's a sharpie." I'm actually going to do that though. Like I I was trying to find usages for this because I don't really do coin material, but pulling a sharpie out of it is just like such a cool moment. Just, yeah. just, just yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's my it's it was, so it's one of the reasons that it exists, right? It's because I came up with using a bottomless purse i came up with that sharpie transfer mm. and it was so beautiful that i was like man I, I wish i could do this but also carry coins in it and they wouldn't fall out so i made a bottomless yeah. purse that has a bottom right which is yeah, great. Sort of yeah. it reminds me of uh john carney's uh, uh cigar routine absolutely yeah. yes yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i dig it yeah, but it's really strong um, yeah, we've got some more from the 20 questions. Should we go into those or, uh, I'm, I'm down forever. Whatever you guys want to do. If people are watching and tuning in, I'll talk for hours. I don't care. We can, we can ask him. You hit up the next one. Well, who's your favorite college. magician? Oh, favorite magician. I don't know that this is possible to answer. Uh, that's why I'm glad we're not in the high pressure. Uh, can I see Chad Long again? I love you, Chad. Yeah, you say Chad. Yeah, that might be my real answer. Um, nice. Yeah. Maybe there's somebody else, but but for now we're going with Chad just because. I mean, none of the Spanish guys. He's a sweetheart. <laughs> you know, you know, like uh, I like to say, yeah, yeah, no, no, more, more, less, less. That's how I force yeah. any card I want. I just go, That's yeah, true. yeah, no, no, more, more, less, less, <laughs> no, no, and then more. I just lay down any number that I want. No, you just, That's amazing. You just go here. No, uh, no, just take this one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Pick anyone. Okay. Oh, just say, okay, take this one. You're taking too long. If I need yeah. to stop you at seven, I just deal seven cards to the table, and then I look at you and I go, yes, no, more, more, less, less, yes, no, you, yeah, no, okay, okay, here. And it just works every time. <laughs> when you confuse them with verbal judo, they just agree with what you're saying. Verbal yeah, judo. That's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, I was watching a, I was watching a Danny D'Artis thing the other day, and I think that he's, you know, he has a lot of good, good stuff, but a lot of it is very specific to working with him you know and uh and there are certain th things where he's just like yeah so i don't i don't give people any options he's like i just tell them what to do right now he's like, and it feels right. like free choice he's like i'm dealing cards down right now he doesn't go while i'm dealing the cards down say stop anytime you want he's like i'm dealing cards down right now say stop <laughs> and, right. like, and he's even got things where he like bumps into them and stuff right if they yeah. don't stop he's like i'm dealing cards down right now say stop and bumps into them hey go, stop, what do you think <laughs> yeah. yeah when the and verbal again, judo doesn't work you got to hit him with real judo yeah <laughs> and i'm what? not like i'm not like i'm not talking bad about any of those guys what they do works for them and works for them really well i do believe that there's some part of the language barrier that helps them a lot and and that it, oh, I, I see i see young kids trying to do that stuff and it doesn't work and i see them getting frustrated with it um yeah <laughs> because, it, because it might only work if you speak. i love when you have no accent and you go, how do you say shuffle? How do you say exactly, shuffle? exactly, That's yeah. exactly what I was just what? saying. <laughs> like, because that comes up say, every single shuffle. time. How do you say shuffle? And it's like, <laughs> and I always go, I couldn't use that. Yeah. All Brent has frozen again. Brent's looks frozen like again. Uh oh. Over again. Brent. I mean, but he's got a great face there. Look at that. He like, does let have me, a great I'm face. gonna take a like, photo. Why don't we just, like, yeah, blow that up. I'm gonna take a photo. This is Brent's oh, new frozen face. promo photo. Let's get a few of this. Right this is there. of a frozen face. This is a good one to get. This like this could one. be way worse. Yeah, right? it's like that scene from How I Met Your Mother where um, Neil Patrick Harris can't take a bad photo. Is like the whole premise, and every single time she tries to catch him off guard, it just ends up being like a photo shoot. <laughs> photo. <laughs> That is is a good photo though. Like if that if, is a good photo. He's frozen longer debris. this time than last time. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a full on dropout. He just dropped out. College he just, dropout. He said peace. Uh, I'm sure he'll be back. He's probably resetting something. We're taking over the show. One so thing we gotta ask. Yeah. 
Yeah. And what we have a second, I got to ask, because uh, we've had this person on a bunch of times, Philip Goldstein, and everybody always assumes that it's Max Maven. And we don't know if it's Max Maven, right? I highly <laughs> doubt I, it's Max Maven. I highly doubt it as well. But it's hilarious that someone got Philip Goldstein as their their YouTube uh, name. Also, uh, Philip Goldstein, so, on, the, on the thing, okay. On, on your question, I would like to actually address it, even though, like, I know that it's a satirical question and I know yeah. that you're making fun of Pig Cake, but the idea oh, of, like, there was, oh, I was chickens. talking about a question before that, but oh, okay. I yeah, wasn't yeah, going to go with that one. But. <laughs> I, yeah, no, no, no. I know you weren't going to go with this one, but I'd like to at least address it. I think that Pig Cake, when he's making that comment, knows that he's somebody who is extremely passionate about magic and runs a Patreon entirely dedicated to teaching magic that's like a full academy and then is constantly posting magic tutorials. And so he's being self-deprecating as a member of that group, being like, oh, isn't it so funny that like we're all a bunch of virgins that like, you know, just do card tricks and like people think we're gay because we're doing card tricks, which is, I mean, magician definitely has a flamboyant connotation. I know that his language definitely could be taken offensively and is intentionally inflammatory, but I also understand that like it's like someone from any kind of I don't want to say magicians are a marginalized group because we're not. It's mostly a bunch of old white dudes. But like any person who's a member of any group or marginalized class making jokes about their own group is a lot less bad than someone pointing the finger at another group and making fun of them, you know? That's true. So that's just, you know, all I was going to say. But like, I just seen this question came up before was uh, Pig Cake seems to be the new face of illusionists on YouTube. I haven't seen that, but so I don't know. I uh, saw him post it on like uh, one of one of their Instagram pages, but I haven't seen the YouTube. Yeah. And so he said, it, what's his Brent's opinion if he even cares? Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, every company has their... Um, their own opinion on who they want to represent their company. So uh, yeah. if Pig Cake is the face of illusionists, then that's that's an illusionist, right? Uh, and whether we like it or not, uh, that's that's up to them to decide. So, yeah, um, I mean, yeah. I think that it's I think it's a smart decision. I, I mean, think that Pig they, Cake's very funny and they they would easily take it, uh, you know, whether they, you know, obviously they didn't pick him going, if if they did pick him and that's a thing that's happening now, they didn't go, this is a bad business decision. You know, they obviously looked through this and said, you know, this fits our genre, uh, which we'll get to later in the show if Brent comes back. Um, but they, you know, it fits who they are and fits what they're looking for and what they want to do. And so, yeah, that's that's why they would do it. Someone said, "Oh yeah. my gosh, no one, nobody cares." Yeah. <laughs> Great, yeah. uh, Phil. I, I, I mean, haven't seen that. I haven't really seen many of Pig Cake streams. I kind of only know him from our interactions that when he was on the show and like a couple messages. But um, yeah, I don't know what he's really like as a as a person and what kind of content he puts out and that stuff. Uh, and you know, we'd be up for. I, I think that's just not necessarily territory that we should get in. Yeah, yeah. You know. I'm not going to answer those questions. And that's why I said I was going back to the other question earlier. But um, but yeah, like I said, that's the company's decision to do what they want to do. We can't change anything that they do. They obviously think that that person fits what they're trying to do or trying to accomplish. So uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd say we're going to leave it at that. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Ethan and says... Also, like, people should know that we don't endorse or condone any of necessarily the opinions of our guests on the show. Um, we are, we just, you know, are here to talk about magic and, and, uh, yeah. and lasagna. We're here to just yeah. have a funny, wacky time with our guests. We like we're, you know, we're not necessarily here to get to, you know, into very serious issues because that's not necessarily our place here. But. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And that's the thing is every single person uh, that's watching is going to have a different opinion on things, which is great because we all can have opinions. And some of them, some people will think those opinions are right. And some people will think that they're wrong. And I mean, that's what makes us all unique. Uh, you know, if we were all the exact same, life would be a very boring place. Um, I do agree. I said, Grant says spreading hate is, is, is for weak minded. We, you know, no one should spread hate. You know, we shouldn't hate each other. Uh, you know, and that's the thing that we love about the show is we get to talk to magicians 
uh, all access behind the curtains to see who the magician is off stage. And that's why we love doing the show is because we get to talk to people and see who they are off stage, like Brent, you know, yeah. who knew that Brent's, you know, uh, uh, you know, pet peeve was shuffling after, after, a, after a pass, you know? Uh, yeah. So now when I see him, I might just have to do that while I'm talking to him a couple of times. Uh, but that's what, yeah. that's what we love. Yeah. And the thing is that we don't necessarily agree with the guests on a lot of things. I mean, this no. episode, we certainly talked about things that we disagreed with Brent on and, and had an interesting, I think, fascinating discussion on it. But also like when it comes to um, like we had Chris Kenner on the previous week and, you yep. know, Ryan and I are both religious people and are, you know, outwardly about that. Also very much enjoy. I personally very much enjoy talking to atheists and talking about the it. and love the back and forth about it because I don't. I I think that there is a way to talk about where science and religion meet and reconcile in the middle rather yeah. than thinking that you need to throw the baby out with the bathwater on either side. But, you know, Chris is somebody who's very outwardly atheistic and also kind of, you know, was bashing religion a little bit. I don't know if on the yeah. show, but definitely before the show. Before and it was something where it was like, you know, we, you know, we enjoy people as people and, you know, don't endorse everybody's opinion on everything. But it's a good thing to talk with them about it. Yep. And that's the thing is, uh, yeah, we've we've had lots of conversations on and off air with with our beliefs and stuff and how they fit. And, you know, in the magic community, it's kind of a a faux pas, maybe, I guess, because there isn't a lot of people that are, are believers in the magic community. There's more and more I, I'm finding. But um, but, you know, not everybody's going to agree with us. And that's fine. You know, as long as we love and respect one another. And I think that's what you know, any community that we're involved in, whether it's here on YouTube or, you know, with your community that you live in, it should all be about love and respect uh, and, you know, and not not hating each other or bashing each other or talking behind people's backs and trying to bring people down. That's yeah. that's not uh, it's not what we want. So. Yeah, um, so let's go on to Ethan's question while we're in for Brent. Yeah. See. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised Brent hasn't sent me a message. So maybe his internet went down or something. Cause it's pretty crazy, but and I, I um, appreciate you saying that Lindsay. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And we love each and every one of you guys that watch the show. Um, uh, it says not everyone is going to agree. I don't think that's right. Yeah. I mean, it's just a joke. Yeah. It's yeah. Just yeah. Okay, I was like, uh, no, I don't think everybody is going to. Um, but uh, everything. let's go to Ethan's question. A much more lighthearted question, more about what the show is about. Who are your guys' favorite magicians? Blaze, who's your favorite magician? I don't think we've answered. We haven't really uh, answered a lot of those questions. Who's my favorite magician? He uh, said, Brent just sent me a message says, looks like my Wi-Fi crashed. Oh, geez. Um, I'd say probably... Oh, I don't know. I have a lot of different magicians that I like for different reasons. You know, I like, uh, I like, uh, Colin cloud a lot. Um, especially his work ethic and knowing him as a, as a good personal friend. Um, and you know, really look up to him, but also I'd say probably Aussie is one of the people who's in, in, influenced me the most um and even some of the things that i've created have been like through wanting to show aussie stuff and screwing <laughs> up and, you know and then not not liking how my performance was for him so trying to make That's it awesome. better and coming up with 50 different variations for how to do it better um yeah, but he's yeah. somebody who definitely influenced me because it was because of aussie that i decided to learn stack and that opened up a whole new world for me when it came to indexing and creating magic with, you know, with a different style without the same procedure and stuff. And uh, and it's been cool to then be able to show him the progression since since he influenced me so much to then be able to show him stuff that like he bought my download and wanted to learn it from me, which is just like some weird full circle kind of thing. Um, yeah. But yeah what, what, who would you say? That's a, it is a great question. Um, Blaze Sarah. Uh, no, uh, no, <laughs> I mean, incorrect. Uh, sorry. No, uh, you know what? I, I would say there's a couple people, uh, I do mentalism. I, I started off doing magic and stuff. Um, so I, I really loved going and watching Penn and Teller, um, because I thought they were really smart in scripting stuff. Uh, and I mean, it's Penn talking, but the movements of Teller on stage really inspired me. Hmm. Um, but 
this guy, I've seen him perform live a few times. Uh, it's got oh, to be Darren. It's got to yeah. be Darren Brown. Yeah. Uh, I went for dinner with Darren, and Darren is a guy that when you eat dinner with him, you don't want to take your eyes off of because mm. there's just he's got some type of thing that draws you to him. Uh, mm. And so he, without a doubt, would be my number one person. Um, but I mean, there's also like, you know, I, I worked with, um, Anthony Owen who worked with, with, uh, with Darren back when he started and stuff, you know, someone that mo a lot of people like in the magic community, I mean, he's big in the magic community, but no one's heard of. Right. And, but like a brilliant, brilliant guy that, you know, mm -hmm. so all of those guys that go into that development would be would be up there in my favorites because I know all the work that they've put in to create those shows with Darren. So I, I mean, Copperfield, Copper, if we want to talk work ethic, the guy like <laughs> talking to Chris last week does still does 15 shows a week and has more success than anyone else in the world uh, doing magic. But is like, I still need to do 15 shows a week. Mm. Yeah. I mean, none of us have to do that. Yeah. Uh, Brent says that he's trying to fix it now. Okay. And then he says, yeah, it looks like my wife is completely dead. Non-magician. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I mean, now you're just asking who's your favorite person. Uh, my wife. Um, yeah. Yeah. Got um, to answer that one. <laughs> yeah. My mom and dad. No, I, I, I mean, yes, but um, I mean, oh, Elias is in here. Elias, Elias what's going what's on, up, Elias? Man? Elias is a beast. Elias, we actually talked one time. Your name came up. We said we should bring Elias on the show sometime. Yeah, yeah, he's just a about. young phenom. Oh, it looks like Brent is back. Yeah. But no, we can't oh, call no. him a phenom. Our only worry was that his ego would get that is true. Yeah, I don't age. want to say phenom because you I could suck, still Elias. Get, get on the show so you can talk about how bad you are. Right. Actually, I have something of Elias's um, right there. Oh, oh, shoot, Elias, oh, I shoot. got you. I oh. know I got you. Uh, so it looks like Brent is currently driving. Should we bring him back in here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can bring him back in. Brent, what's going on? Yeah, no. So my Wi-Fi died entirely at the shop. So nice. I'm now uh, in the car to drive home, and then hopefully we'll have Wi-Fi there depending on how long, uh, how much longer you guys are going to hang out. I, I love that you had just finished saying like during the 20 questions, like, yeah, if you guys want to ask me more questions, I can talk about this stuff forever. We could go for <laughs> hours. Just and then yeah. it's like, ah. <laughs> just like, like oh, that was just like a magic trailer. He just totally yeah. lied. Straight yeah, up. Just I thought lied. that it was, uh, I thought that was when I was making fun of the Spanish magicians, those guys were watching and yeah. they just like did their magic and got rid of me. Yeah, That's they it. just DDoSed you, man. Oh, you know, the U.S. Uh, they just US went, oh, more internet oh. Is, is, is now being hacked by the, the Spanish. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, but, but yeah, we'll be on here for a little bit. Uh, if you so, want to, uh, so I'm still, remember when I came in earlier, I was having trouble with the sound? I'm yeah. back to that thing. Oh, okay. So can we put me in the sound booth and then bring me back? Do you think that'll solve it like earlier? Yeah, we can try. Uh, cool. I can send you the uh, I can send you the link for it, and then um, and then see. I mean, the thing is that honestly, that's never happened to us before. That by just throwing somebody into a different room, that they suddenly had better audio. But like the fact that it magically worked is is cool. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, uh, I'm only basing that. it on the idea that it worked earlier, right? Yeah. 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 Totally. Okay. I just put it into the private chat. If you, you check uh, that, go into I'll, that, uh, you can do. And then you come back. Just, do you want to do that? I'll continue looking through questions. Yeah, totally. And uh, so I saw Elias said, no, Ryan. Yeah, Elias, I owe you a punch now. Thanks, buddy. Get uh, wrecked, Elias. Yeah. yeah, you're toast, buddy. You should just quit now. Quit yeah, while you're you ahead. Quit <laughs> Please, for the rest of us. Please yeah. quit. <laughs> quit while you're ahead. Uh, oh, yeah, good job. So then Lindsay said, good answer for my uh, wife. And then says, well, unless your wife and your mom uh, and dad are magicians, they are disqualified. But he's, they said non-magicians. So, um, oh, okay. He, uh, please yeah. mute himself. Okay. 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 Uh, and Pavel said, and also we have a baby girl doing telekinesis in Russia. Oh, that, that is pretty sick. That's um, amazing. That's, uh, yeah. that's like, Oh, another guy that we should bring on the show is Derek Whitnick. A lot of people in the community don't necessarily know him. He has a daughter 
who yeah he, yeah from I you talking to me of this. yeah from like birth he raised this daughter homeschooled her and taught her second sight along with teaching her just like how to read and write and like so she's just known second sight instinctively like her first language and yeah. uh, she's just one of the best in the world at second sight at such a young age it's amazing uh all right I, Brent, how's it going can you hear us now i can so now it seems like you're in both rooms so i'm getting double audio <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. I'll, uh, I'll, okay. Can you kick me out of the other room? I did kick you out of. I'm not even in the other room anymore. Uh, so I think that you have double audio because there's two of you in here. I'm gonna kick the other one from the studio. Yeah. Is this there better now? Yeah, that fixed it. Nice. Perfect. There we go. Okay, hold on. Um, I like Ethan said. Uh, what is a movie or show that you've watched that inspired a trick or a piece of script? Hmm. That's a great question. I don't. I I remember I saw AGT one time and I saw that. Uh, or no, no no it was SNL. I saw SNL and I saw Jimmy Fallon going from um going through the whole uh, backstage for this Christmas special and then getting on stage and had like a steady cam follow him. So I opened my show in a very similar way where my show was on the rooftop of a theater and I started on Hollywood Boulevard at the Walk of Fame next to the poster of me and then ha was basically like getting ready for the show as this opening video and everyone and everyone's watching like this. Um, it was like a movie theater on a rooftop. So they're watching the screen and they, the opening video is me apparently down on hollywood boulevard next to the poster then like doing a quick change and then like making a deck of cards appear and like making my mic appear and like all of these other things as i walked up the stairs and the camera's following me until i eventually get to the rooftop when we then cut to the actual live feed because like it was all pre-recorded because i wasn't gonna do that all live <laughs> but then like got to the actual thing and then like started the show so it was like it was a it was a fun you know way and we did a cool way of like transitioning it so you, it was kind of seamless but yeah that was like a that was a fun thing that inspired it a show moment um you know yeah you know. i think if anything i get visuals more from from art than i do from you know i see a visual of like a cool piece of art or a cool sculpture or a cool thing and i go wow i like the way that that you know i like the way that thing works i like the silhouette of that right the other thing i, I talk about a little bit in in consulting, and I think this comes from probably uh, maximum entertainment, is the idea of like, you know, you don't turn your back on the audience. You turn your back 30 degrees because now suddenly you have a nicer silhouette, right? If you see me squared up with my shoulders, my feet still facing almost forward and my shoulders turned, now the silhouette of my body is just a, a nicer silhouette than just a lumpy back that's square and boxy, right? It's more interesting. So mm -hmm. I sort of talk about in, in, we talk about this a lot on Fool Us, right? If you're on TV for three minutes, what are those five silhouettes, those five beats, those five memories that they can capture and remember, right? Um, and I get a lot of that from like, from art. And I think you'll see a lot of that in the, in the Dustin Tavella stuff, right? Like if you watch some of that, you'll see like a lot of interesting visuals that, that just, you know, I, uh, you, that I get from street art or I get from, you know, wherever mm -hmm. I'm at in the real world. Right. Like, and I'm sure some of that's also in, influenced by film, but I can't think of a specific moment. Maybe actually, again, I talked about the princess bride. There's a trick that I used to do. That's uh, that's based on inconceivable, which is the idea where you talk about, you know, literally the process of the princess bride in the film and how that inspired you to do this thing, which was kind of interesting, but yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I guess uh, there are, all, let me, uh, I'm trying to remember what the name of the movie is. I know it's with Scarlett Johansson. Uh, Plays describes plagiarism. <laughs> time stamp. <laughs> it was. It was. I mean, yeah, it was loosely, directly inspired. Um, for me, for me, it's uh, mostly music for pretty much everything because I feel like music creates a sonic landscape that only exists within the mind of the artist that isn't necessarily based in reality but has patterns that can then be manifested in reality um, that strike a chord with some deep meaning. And so I usually try to take music and interpret the feelings that are created within me into a visual format with magic. Um, so like music, I think, is a big inspiration more than i mean but i know the original question was movie or show but definitely yeah. uh so mine was uh lucy uh lucy and limitless because i did bring out a show called limitless uh but i was more inspired by einstein uh you can't see but it's up on the shelf there uh because i heard a quote when i was younger that said to become smarter you need to practice thinking 
And I thought that was really great. And they said it was by Einstein. I've never been able to find it since, but, uh, but I thought it was fantastic. Uh, it's not one of his most famous quotes, but, um, but I thought, okay, well, what does that mean? And so with Limitless, it was about taking a drug and being limitless. And same with Lucy. Lucy is very much based or, or kind of correlated with those. But I always thought it was really cool to see someone's brain become smarter. And so then I based my show off the urban myth that humans only use 10% of their brain. Uh, and then the Einstein quote, well, what, uh, what if we practice thinking, could we tap into a greater percentage of our brain? So the first half of the show was me showing ways that I practiced. And then the second half of the show was me doing uh, tricks that I could do once I unlocked a greater percentage of my brain. So yeah, it was, it was a fun show. I, I really like it. I probably should have done the show more, but then I, I always love writing. And so I wrote a new show. <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll bring it back one day. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah. We got a lot of a lot of comments. Yeah, we got a lot of comments. I mean, Lindsay I said, love, "I love Max. That's what my favorite Disney movie is." And then Grant said, "Cinderella." And Tigger said, "Wally." Yeah, uh, I think it was Hunchback of Notre Dame, right? Right? Like that's. Uh... Oh wow! Uh, RB says, "This is the first time I've ever heard anyone be inspired by the movie Lucy." It's a great. I actually love it. Like, if you haven't seen it, watch it. She she basically becomes a computer in the end. Like she's constantly sucking up information and at one point can tell like you know what her body is doing like you know how she's like i can control the proteins in my body and all this other stuff and it's like wow that is fascinating to the and i mean there's people that be, like truly believe that you could do that you know through meditation and stuff like that and so it was kind of neat i think and i think if you look at it on a deeper level it's like wow wouldn't that be crazy if the human uh if we could get to that level that that is possible. So. Yeah. Now, Brent, do you have a, uh, say a, when you're talking about creative problem solving, if you're given a, an impossible problem and need to solve it, do you have a set, uh, kind of creative process that you find yourself going into maybe that you've intuitively developed or that you've, you've formed over time? Is it always different? Or, you know, or do you find yourself kind of falling into the same pattern of how you go about solving an impossible problem? Yeah, no, it's usually the same, the same process, right? And the weird thing about my process is a lot of times I solve problems by arguing mm -hmm. with people mm -hmm. and then taking the different approach just to see what that different approach would look like, right? So we talk mm -hmm. about the idea of thinking outside of the box. It's nice to have somebody else put me in that box. And then let me fist fight against that box, right? So normally I create best when I'm on a two or three person team. When I show somebody an idea and I say, tell me what's you tell me what you would do with this, tell me what you think about this. And then when they tell me I want to break that, like I like breaking stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So then I want to break that down and I want to break that and and argue it from the other direction, right? Like like I want to constantly have somebody form an opinion and then I want to say, here's why I want to disagree with that opinion, and here's how I can disagree with it. And then it sort of puts my brain in check in another direction. Mm -hmm. Um, and then a lot of times through that process, I'll immediately come up with th the middle, which is the thing that is the solution, right? Which is the original idea wasn't the best. My argument is, is correct in some form. And then that's like negotiation down to the center of where the problem, the solution arises. And it's also great because a lot of times when you're doing that with a team of people, you'll see everybody get there at the same time. You'll, you'll just look at the other person and you'll be like, you're right. I'm right. We're both wrong oh my gosh, this is the solution. And it's yeah. like, you know, when you can get that sort of synergy, it's, it's incredible. And I think that happens a lot. <clears throat> now, team consulting, when you can get a team that, that agrees that there's no such thing as a stupid idea and mm -hmm. that anything we think of can be thrown on the table. And, and now we're talking about, you know, making a silk vanish and appear in the audience somewhere. And somebody's like, what if we trained a ferret? to take it out under the seats and everybody's like, Oh my gosh, well that won't work, but maybe a drone, maybe a reel, maybe. Yeah. And now the sudden that way out of outside thought changes the entire direction of, of the conversation, which, which helps a lot, right? You have to have a safe space, right? Um, where any idea as crazy as it is, is on the table so that mm. everybody's comfortable and that's how you move forward. Yeah. 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 Now, putting yourself in a box or, you know, putting parameters around things, I think only leads to what I would say is our favorite segment of the show to see Absolutely. 
if we can put Brent inside a box and see if he can get himself out of this one. See how he gets himself out of, oh, this is a deep, thick, a deep dish box that you're in right now. And uh, it's that time. Lasagna! Lasagna! What's your favorite genre of lasagna? Meat. Lasagna. Veggie. Lasagna. Plain. Lasagna. Saucy. Lasagna. What's your favorite genre of lasagna? Keller. Lasagna. Cheese. Lasagna. Lasagna. Blaze, Blaze was just dancing on the stove. He let that go thinking, way longer. I was, Brent was like, I let it go long that time. Brent was like unimpressed. He's I, like, I hate you. <laughs> well, it was weird because because I'm not getting the sound for those. I guess it comes up muted on my thing. So I've just seen a cartoon of lasagna for like 15 seconds. <laughs> 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 I think my phone is broken and I'm shaking it. I'm like, am I frozen again? That's amazing. Oh, wow. So, he didn't get the jingle the entire time. You, <laughs> you didn't get any. You gotta go back and watch it on YouTube after, Brent. <laughs> it is the highlight of the show for us. I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, it, uh, it is, but, but I mean that is the brain-numbing he's question. Just watching this animation for an uncomfortably long. <laughs> he's like, he's like, wow. Are these guys? Did they go to the bathroom? Like, what's <laughs> going on here? Uh, this did. Yeah, I froze. I think. <laughs> uh, so, Brent. Putting you inside a box, what's your favorite genre of lasagna? Uh, this is a trick question for me because I don't know a lot of lasagna genres, but I do know that there's like this vegetable. Oh, you know what? Actually, no, there is. At the local farmer's market, speaking of supporting local businesses, at the local farmer's market, there's this artichoke Alfredo lasagna thing with wow. mushrooms in it that's delicious. I don't know that that counts as a, as a genre. But like, can we go with Alfredo? Artichoke, Alfredo lasagna. lasagna, absolutely. And that just so you one. get the experience of it, we're gonna relive the Chris Kenner moment <laughs> of what's your favorite genre of lasagna, so you get to experience the jingle real quick. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's it's gonna lasagna, lasagna. What's your favorite genre of lasagna? Meat. Meat. So anyways, that's, uh, that's what and then it mean. goes on for another three minutes. It uh, goes on for a lot longer. It's definitely yeah. better when you can hear it. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It's definitely better. <laughs> Uh, I like Grant says the lyrics are too loud. Yeah, uh, we've got I've got a new mic now, so going to re-record it. Yeah, we're re-recording the lasagna song, um, and we we do own genreoflasagna.com, so we can put up a ten-hour looping version of the song. Also, check out allaccessmagic.com/shop if you want to get some uh, some lasagna merch. Lasagna merch, nice. And we that actually... brings us to our second follow-up question. Yeah, because <laughs> this is where we really put you inside the box and challenge you. So, uh, Brent, if you were to cook one uh, Alfredo artichoke pizza or pizza, wow, that because I'm thinking of artichoke pizza Whoa. in New York City. Wow. That's your favorite yeah, pizza I, of a pizza. <laughs> so, if you were to bake one artichoke uh, lasagna and then you were to bake a second identical Seconds. artichoke lasagna, then Blaze, I'll let you take it away. Now, let's say you take said second identical artichoke, artichoke lasagna and place it atop the first. How many lasagna do you have now? One or two? Or two. I think you have two still. Oh. Mm. I, my, 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 I'm basing my theory on the fact that I believe one of the best parts of the lasagna are the crispy top. And you don't get crispy top in the center of a lasagna. So I think at the moment we stack them, we have two crispy tops. I think we've created maybe a much more delicious lasagna. But I think that crispy layer in the center makes me think I'm entering a second lasagna, not continuing the first. Oh, wow. this is a Does good that make answer. sense? Does that make crispy sense? Crispy top. Yeah, you got top sense. in the middle. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Because, it's, 
Because top, I mean, we're agree in agreement that top is the best part, right? Oh, that top, mm. that crispy sort of shelly. I think yeah. I think you're I think you're gross. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't like the crispy layer of cheesy stuff on it. It just means it got big. That means it got big too gooey, long. Gooey insides, man. Yeah. 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 All right, I'm wow. going with I'm going with two lasagnas though. I think when you stack them, you don't get now. The, the, if you stack them before you cook them, I think you're at one stuff. Right. Oh, okay. Right. See, it's funny because you and Chris. I mean, you both answered eleven questions during the, but Chris says one. He said one last week, not two. Really? One, and so does our hoodie. So does our, our lasagna mathematics hoodie. It does I say see. that one plus yeah. one equals one. But I do understand, you know, Takumi. But, but, wait, 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 wait. Well, let's wait, wait. About... Let's dig into this, guys. We're going to have a problem in. here. Yeah. Let's we... <laughs> so the problem with one plus one equals one is that if we define that, we also have to define that infinite number of lasagnas stacked in infinite space is still one lasagna. And that mathematically cannot be true. Uh, well, I mean, if you can uh... eat it all. I, I think that it's a certain thing of like, you know, yes, there's the matter cannot be created nor destroyed, but I think that it's a certain element of like, there there's a level of like apoptosis happening right now. But like, what we have you, to agree, You are right? consuming that other lasagna within another, and there, that previous lasagna's identity has died and gone away. The spirit of lasagna is no longer. I'm still stuck in the idea that one can't equal infinity. One so Brent, here's a question. Here's a question because mm -hmm. this this relates to Takumi. That, no, that's answer. good logic. This relates to Takumi. You guys, you, you all need to talk to a mathematician that, yeah. that, can, that can understand how Kenner, one could possibly equal infinity. Kenner is. Uh, he said he was going to talk to uh, talk to some. Uh, what do you say, physicists or something about this? Because he was like. This question goes so much further than what we think. That's uh, what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the deeper implications of your all's yeah. decision. I, well. Wow. I We hadn't thought about that, that you, if you were to have infinite lasagnas and keep stacking them, then now you're saying that infinity equals one, which right. gets, well, gets interesting. Yeah. It is true. That is true. But, but the question isn't. The question is two. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right, but 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 the question is one. That's plus how we one. get rid of that. Right? That is how I we like, get rid of that. Like I'm just taking the thought experiment. I think so. Further. The thing is, let's say that you had one and then another, right? No, but this is this is very fascinating. What you've just brought up, Brent. Like, mm -hmm. if you have one and another, and you do stack them, and they do equal one, let's right. say that's a given, right? Sure. And then you were to take two other that were identical to the first stack them now you have two identical double lasagnas that equal one each and when stacked would then create one again so right. i think that what we have is a fractal right and so like our t-shirt design just got way more complicated thanks brent <laughs> 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 get, yeah, this, get this t-shirt while you design, because it's a limited so edition like <laughs> don't don't ask me questions you don't want to know the answer to that's, right? that's, like, that's literally what uh this the the lasagna mathematics uh hoodie and t-shirt have just become limited edition because the math will be changing uh, so get them while you can All i, access I also think it's com. it's uh, from an artistic standpoint let's leave mathematics behind from an artistic standpoint infinite lasagna is a better solution anyway it is, right. it is true. It is. So it is, here, it let's is. let's go with this though. So Takumi came up with a fantastic answer as well. The lasagnas do this, like they're just fractaling. Like you, the, no matter yeah. how far you zoom in, it still looks the same because it just still looks like lasagna. Like, right. like you just keep zooming in, and you're just gonna find more layers of our like, but the layers are made of lasagna themselves. Because what is a lasagna other than layers of pasta and sauce and cheese? But what if those layers themselves are lasagna individually? You know, we might we <laughs> might even need to go into we might even need to go into cooking theory, right? Like this might be a, a, a Gordon Ramsay question or a, or a Alton Brown would answer it, right? We Alton might Brown. have him on the show. What is the what is the number of layers as defined by lasagna that makes a lasagna? Is there a number, oh. right? I don't know enough about cooking, but what if Alton Brown tells us that lasagnas are always between six and nine layers? If we get that information, it changes oh, our entire screw perspective. Alton. 
<laughs> oh, that hack trying to break our lasagna physics. Yeah. We got to do more with uh, what was that? What was that one? There was a YouTube show where it was like dudes cooking uh, and they just added like bacon to everything. Oh, you're talking about Epic Meal Time. It was Epic Canada. Meal Time. Yeah. Yeah. Is it Epic Meal Time? Yeah. Epic Meal Time. Yeah. That's those are the guys we're following. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got to ask them. <laughs> we got to ask um, those guys. But I, so, think we could, I think we could tweet Alton and find out. But here's the question. Somebody uh, should do that. Uh, yeah, that's we're, <laughs> that's definitely going to happen. <laughs> um, so Takumi said it depended on if he baked lasagna so that he could see it uh, being put together. Right. Which also makes a massive like brain fart. Like, right, right. Tree in the brain brain right? Fart. If you deliver me the Tree lasagna brain as brain one, fart. then I could believe it's one. But if I see mm -hmm. two lasagna stack, then I know it's two. Mm. yeah that's pretty yeah. that's pretty that's, heady that's heavy too right because yeah, if right. i bring you a massive lasagna even though i've cooked it too although you although i, I still one. believe that goes back to my original conceit and that is that the crispy center layer but breaks that here's, conceit. here's the I question find it in the as middle well, and i go what the hell is this no mm, but if you so you this, discover and suddenly it entirely changes your perspective <laughs> but, but, but hang on if you stack it on top the bottom layer is usually like the like I'm gonna say the juicy layer because it's right. like wet. So now yeah. you stack that on the crispy one. That crispy layer in the middle might not be might crispy. reabsorb the I moisture and no longer be crispy. Sure, mm -hmm. sure, that's a valid oh, point. Oh yes, yeah. Might. Can that's you revitalize like a uh, like one of those skin creams that they sell at the mall next to your magic shop? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Your previous magic shop, like, Lindsay. Revitalize. This, yeah. this enormous. Lindsay has a great comment. She yeah. says, uh, man, then all multi-layer cakes are multiple cakes. Whoa. <sighs> I don't... That's tough, right? <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay. Lindsay, that was the best answer I've heard. Lindsay. Oh, there was the other comment from Albert earlier, but Lindsay, that's a mind-blowing comment as well. So You know, it's so, so funny because Ryan... What were we going to say, Brett? Well, I was just going to say, from a, I'm still on the lasagna thing. From a cooking standpoint, is the top layer of the lasagna the same as the inside layers? Is it just cheese and sauce, or does it get an extra thing? I think it's I'm just. I mean, right. well, we got to look at we've got to look at the graphic, and well, it does get an extra garnish. Well, an example of that, right, would be let's just look at a oh. traditional lasagna. I think it has ricotta cheese between the layers, but it doesn't have ricotta cheese on top, right? It just has. No, mozzarella but people cheese. put like mozzarella cheese, yeah. Yeah, but doesn't it have ricotta in the center or no? But I don't think all you lasagnas can't... have ricotta. Okay. I think it just depends. I think that's a definitely that's a that's a genre of. Uh, I see. Uh, I see. That's... Grant says feta. So that's now the... I now the thing is I would Grant, assume Grant, like let's say you've got that talk. crispy. I think that let's say that you've got that crispy layer, then the sauce from the lasagna that's on top would go down and rehydrate. And then if you were to bake it again together, it would re like coalesce, like coagulate. Yeah. I'm in agreement into... there as long as it's exactly the same ingredients, right? As long as the top layer. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't know enough about lasagna, so I'm not I'm not qualified to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> we're not even qualified to ask it at this point. It's gotten yeah. out of our hands. <laughs> but but if the top layer is indeed made of exactly the same thing as the center layers, and and we do scientific studies to dis discover that we can re-wet or re-moisturize that center layer, then I think you guys are onto the single lasagna plan. Could we fool Penn and Teller with this question? Oh, for sure. Okay, that's, sure. that's sure. what I'm on this show. Hit up the magic firm, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like this. If you make one eight layer lasagna and you split it in half, is it one lasagna split in half? Is it two oh. lasagnas? No, you know, uh. we just went backwards to infinity, right? So, so yeah. now the idea is this if, if you can take two lasagnas and make one lasagna, if you cut those in half, you still have, you know, you have two lasagnas, right? Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then we should be able to cut the lasagna in half an infinite number of times and still have lasagna. But we know that's not true. It also know, depends I... on what direction you cut it. If you cut it horizontally and sever its lasagna-ness to just layers of pasta, or if you cut it vertically and have half lasagnas on either side. Now it's just a oh. smaller lasagna of the same amount of layers. You're right. The direction of cut true. is an important because if I if I give you a whole baking sheet that's like this big, full oven, 
of lasagna and then I cut it and I give you your serving. I, I would say that you have a lasagna, right? And then if I were to cut that in half, that would be, hmm. Well, now it becomes down to like intent and who, who did it. <laughs> How so big is that slice? I don't know if I can consider that a slice of lasagna if it's very yeah. small. Uh, I like this and it made me think this is really stupid, but uh, <laughs> said banana pie. Why don't we call it bananas pie? Because how many bananas go into that pie? Is it just one? That's is it legitimate. just one banana pie? No, there's like five bananas in that pie. Sure. Right? Yeah. Well, if I, gonna... if I built a whole brownie tray and I cut you one brownie, that is a brownie, but I really baked you one brownie, right? That is true too. And I can take that one brownie and divide it an infinite number of times and still give you a brownie. Isn't the same logic? I wouldn't. Well, I wouldn't say I gave you a half a brownie or. I, well, I think because brownie's not layered, right? But but we're assuming I think that that if one lasagna becomes two lasagna, if that has to work, that we're cutting it horizontally, right? And we know we can't cut a uh, lasagna infinitely horizontally and still have lasagna. At some point, we just end up with a, a single layer with cheese on top, which ceases to be lasagna, I believe, because it no longer has layers. Well, so the pasta sheet itself is called a lasagna. Yeah. We actually found that out. Oh, well, then, then, because that's what, lasagna, it's lasagna with, an e. with an E, not lasagna with an A. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then I think what we just discovered is that it's still, uh, when you stack the two lasagna, you still have a lasagna, but it's a lasagna's. <laughs> oh, <laughs> because Albert. It's, because it's I'm, multiple layers, right? Albert. You're just adding layers to it. Albert's comments tonight, I absolutely love. Top layer <laughs> has an extra invisible layer. Grandma's love. I'm with Albert 100. percent That top layer, fun episodes. That, yeah. that top layer is like that's the money for me, man. We may like, have to we may have to have a whole nother podcast uh, I, just on lasagna. Well, I, listen, or food I need to do research. In so bring so bring me on. Let me know when we're gonna do this again. I'm Brett, gonna do well, some well, so, will you be will you be at Magic Live? Uh, yeah, I should be at Magic Live. We're doing sure. a whole lasagna eating competition at Magic Live, and we would love for you to be a part of it, either as a competitor or a judge or something. You know, yeah. a referee, mayhaps. You know, <laughs> yeah, is... for, for sure, sign me up. I'm a little concerned about the size of the lasagna you're going to ask us to eat. <laughs> yeah. It could be infinitely large. <laughs> it's, it's 15 stacked on top of each other. It's just one lasagna, guys. Give me a break. <laughs> um, but that goes that goes out to say, too, with our, with our Patreon. Uh, you know, that's one of our stretch goals is uh, the very first night of the convention. We know that there are some other parties that happen during Magic Live. Uh, but we want to have a stretch goal of uh, renting out a suite uh, at the Orleans and filling it with lasagna and having the top uh, guys in the magic industry, you know, all of our guests that have come on the show, come and do a live podcast where we then have a lasagna eating contest. So, uh, you know, not only joining the Patreon, do you get crazy discounts on magic, uh, and a ton of other uh, really awesome uh, giveaways, I guess I'll say. Um, but you also help us do some pretty crazy, awesome stuff in person uh, that becomes content for all of us to enjoy. So essentially, they're buying me lasagna, and I'm a fan. That's it. <laughs> Buy Brent lasagna. He Buy needs Brent it. Lasagna. Magic Live is a very busy time. Com slash all access magic. Buy Brent lasagna. <laughs> yeah. That's what we're doing. It's, uh... I, I can't believe how much. Uh, how much space I'm going to let this question occupy in my brain right now. That's amazing. You know, the thing is, honestly, Ryan and I were talking about this beforehand and we were like, Brent is so deep in the magic world. Like, I wonder if he will, if he will humor the lasagna question. And no. then you have given it the perfect, like most amount of thought that we've ever had. And it's been great. Like, I, But I'm still not done. I'm like, my brain is like, <laughs> Because I can't believe in infinite lasagna. That's the problem I have, right? Yeah. But I don't know how to. I don't know the 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 mathematical formula for proving that. But I'm going to do some research. But I also have to know about lasagna construction. That's the other thing. Before I can even research, I have to know about lasagna construction. So I've got to now, like, literally look up lasagna recipes to find out what the number of layers required to make a lasagna is. Does the artichoke lasagna have artichokes on top? Oh, it doesn't. 
that's a great answer, right? My lasagna, if you stack the ones that I prefer, it is definitely no longer, uh, it is definitely no longer a single lasagna because there's not, there's going to be one layer that's artichokeless. Now, now wait, shit. Wait, 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 wait. we have to be careful because I've never really verified that each layer has artichoke in it. So yes. maybe every other layer has artichoke in it. And then like a pharaoh shuffle, the top layer and the bottom layer alternate if we alternate them. As long as we in them instead of out pharaohing them, then we would still have artichoke on every layer. I think we're there. Uh. Right, I'm going to have lasagna after this. <laughs> in Pharaoh, the lasagna. Um, well, no, wait, wait. This is an interesting question. Though. Think about it. <laughs> and Lindsay we, we says, just, "Well, does it, does it have artichokes on the bottom?" <laughs> we <laughs> that, just that we, we just solved the problem, and I'm in full agreement. If you Pharaoh shuffle the lasagnas, the two tops stay on top in an out Pharaoh, and then it's exactly the same lasagna. I think that solves the problem. If we Pharaoh the layers of lasagna. 100% it never becomes too lasagna. <laughs> be, but the more, Brent, the let's be is... honest, you can't cut lasagna and then shuffle it. <laughs> <laughs> well, which leads to a much bigger discussion. And that is, we, we have to do that before we cook it, which means we're indeed only making one lasagna. <laughs> there you go. So in the end, our answer is correct. It's one lasagna. <laughs> it is one lasagna as long as you farrow, in farrow them. Yeah, we've got to get Nico Pieri on this. <laughs> Uh, Lindsay said, uh, thinking about making a lasagna deck, should, should we, should we talk about that? Well, we are, we are thinking about a deck. Yeah. Um, it's actually pretty sick. Should we show anything? I, I mean, I think we, I think we can, I think, uh, so we actually, we talked about creating a lasagna deck. Uh, I actually made one, uh, a prototype for one or not a prototype, a design for one. But uh, one of our uh, patrons uh, that we're <clears throat> very close friends with and stuff, he was doing some graphic work for us this week. And, uh, and he came up with a deck design that we absolutely loved. And we're like, hey, this is really cool. So, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it right here and, uh, and load it up. But yeah, the, we're going to show the most recent iteration that we've received. Logic is much longer part of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it went out the window. After two and a it's, half hours, we get crazy. It's not yeah. a logic problem, though, right? We're, we're having a hypothetical like yeah. discussion, right? This is a hypothetical yeah, problem, not a logical <laughs> problem, right? Which is why in the hypothetical world, I believe that we could throw shuffle lasagna because it helps solve the hypothetical problem we're trying to solve, right? It does, yeah. You keep the no. same top and bottom. You end up with, I mean, yeah, it, it's just Although, that's a perfect solution. The lasagna deck made me actually think of now a flourishing deck that is lasagna. So every card can be different. So there could be layers uh, of lasagna. Trademark uh, allaccessmagic.com. Uh, Magic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just logging down that D, <laughs> the ID. <laughs> Anything that is uh, lasagna, lasagna related bit. is now trademarked by us. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I can show this if you'd like. The, uh, the most recent iteration of the deck design. That we uh, that we have right now, and uh, this is what it's looking like. So, so if uh, can we can we zoom in on it? Yeah, yeah, I can make myself big. That. Let me let's do that. Oh, okay, here, oh, oh. so here, so this is. So if you guys see, this is our all access deck. Yeah, yeah, that uh, looks sick. <clears throat> all access magic logo repeating. Uh, with a marking system uh, built in as well. It's uh, really, really clever that, uh, that we're pretty happy with. Uh, yeah, so I mean, there may be some changes and stuff as well, but... Yeah, that looks sick. Thank you. Thank you. Dig it. Thanks, man. Dig it. Thanks. So, yeah. We're very excited for that. So that's that's a very, very sneak peek because that's something that's like, you know, it, it will be very... It will be coming soon, but very new to us you know we've only started working on it recently can can we tell them the one idea that i had i don't even know I what idea you're gonna say so yeah with uh with patrons uh which sure okay i don't know i, I don't know. <laughs> obviously it's something that oh, we yeah, want to yeah. release 
the, oh yeah, yeah, with the, the card. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So it's something that we want to release. Uh, so what we thought about doing, uh, and which we'll, we'll do uh, in one way, shape or form, is that every single person that is a patron of ours will have their name added into the deck, uh, whether it's with the Jokers or the ad card or something like that. Uh, so everybody that is part of our patrons that are one of our patrons that makes this show possible will automatically have their name put in no matter what tier you're at. Uh, and so we thought uh, that would be super cool. Or we're going to create a limited edition box that is only for patrons that then has your name on the box. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to, once we, once we announce there will be a limited amount of time to join the Patreon so that you can end up as one of the people that's, uh, that's actually printed in this piece of history. So yeah, really excited for that. Now there was something that we were talking about earlier, uh, Brent, and you were talking about what happens when you have a lot of really good solutions. And sometimes your, your way of getting out of that is like, um, is to just set a timer and then, you know, you're kind of forced into it. And I definitely do that a lot, especially with people that I'm consulting with. But like part of the the process and part of the thing that I'm going to be lecturing on at Blackpool, um, I don't know if I've announced that on the show yet, but I'm going to be lecturing at Blackpool. So if you're there, I'll, I'll see you <laughs> and uh, hope you come to the lecture. Um, but one of the, the steps that I have, and it's something that I've kind of ended up just um, intuitively doing, but uh, sometimes will find myself breaking back into a more um, formulaic process if I'm if I'm consulting with somebody is um, is generating criteria and then grading that grading my solutions based on that criteria. So like I'll throw out in I'll give a set amount of time and we'll set a timer and we have to generate as many possible solutions to our underlying problem that you know our, our main magic effect that we're trying to create as possible just constantly bouncing that around and there's no bad ideas and then once we get to that we have to pick our like eight best ones and then after that we generate five criteria for what would be a really good solution and what would be the exact ideal image for that that scene that we're seeing in our mind and then mathematically scoring like on a scale of one to eight the the solutions based on the criteria until we get the best solution objectively um and sure. I, that's something that i kind of most of the time just do intuitively and don't actually break out a piece of paper and start doing it's kind of just like you know part of the process or you know you it's usually a lot easier than that because you usually don't have a ton of solutions that all work you have you kind yeah. of just do what works but just wondering like what you know if you have certain kind of uh like formulaic things that you do that like help you to uh to be able to you know generate the best solutions for yourself or for your clients yeah, I do a, a very similar thing, but right. So I sort of do uh, uh, write down the solutions as they come. They all go into individual pieces of paper and then we mm. go through that and, and either, or, right. We could do mm. this either, or this one. Okay. That one wins. Think about mm. it like a sweet 16 tournament, either, or this one. Okay. This one's better than this yeah, one. Yeah. This just one down here is better one. than that one. And then it's yeah. driving you down. And then when you get down to the one that you think is the best method, you say, okay, we've eliminated these other 15, but how can what these 15 brought to the table strengthen the number one that we've ended up on. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah. So if you look at a trick like position impossible, that's a prime example of it where I had been doing, um, uh, a mispipped index, uh, 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 card at number has existed for, for years in the, in the, not the, is it the mastermind deck? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it's the mastermind deck. So the mastermind deck had done a card at number using mispipped cards for years, but it only had one cover card. So you couldn't really show full face cards. So I believed that going through the sweet 16 process that a Svengali deck was a better method. So I got down to Svengali deck as my core method. But then I looked back at all the other methods and said, what strengths do they have that we can then apply to this, which is when I created this Svengali deck that's mispipped. And we're using the strength of one solution to run off into who we, who was what we thought was the best solution. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the first thing I want to do is if I've got 16 <clears throat> solutions, I want to drive down to which one I think is the best. And then I take the other 15 and write below them what the benefit they have was, how they even made it over into the sweet 16. And now I have 15 benefits. And I say of these 15 benefits, can any of these benefit the solution that I believe is the top solution? Mm, right. Yeah, I also think great, that yeah. that helps you create multi-layered effects, which is what mm -hmm. I think really fools people long term. Right. At the end of Svengali card at number, their solution in the car at home might be, oh, he had more than one two of diamonds and he never showed us the full deck. So that's probably the solution. 
So now this strengthens that because in the car ride home, they go, oh, no, no. At the end of the trick, he spread out the deck and I saw every single card. Mm -hmm. There were no extra two of diamonds. So now that layering is what's helping them, you know, not peel the onion apart to the core so quickly because they're getting another layer that's canceling out another layer. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people find one solution and stick with it. And sometimes that's flawed logic. I think find a, one solution, stick with it, but then look at all the failed solutions and see what strengths they might be able to prop up the actual solution with. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. That's great. Yeah. And then you're not you're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, like all of the great ideas that have come from those other solutions that just didn't didn't end up being the best one. You know, you're still yeah. getting the inspiration and yeah, that's great. Yeah. And then I also now I have these 15 other ideas, but it's been a creative process because now I sort of check mark those in my brain and I say, oh, I hadn't realized that an advantage of this is this. So now next time I work on another project, right? Like sometimes some, at some point I said, I forget what it was, something about like, there's no such thing like failed ideas don't belong in the garbage bin. They belong in the recycle bin. And that's sort of the process, mm. right? As yeah. I'm solving a problem, I'm learning to solve future problems, having thought about a mispipped deck more than I've ever thought about it, right? What advantages it has, what disadvantages it has, how it works, how it doesn't work, you know, mm. it's interesting. Um, and then I and then I get all the way down to that with so now we have we have a solution to the problem um, and we believe it's the best solution and we believe it's propped up by two other methods that make it better than it would be at its core. And now we think about the language of the trick, right, which is a thing I think a lot of people think that scripting is separate from method. But as we know from tricks like Magician's Choice, that's not true. Mm. Uh, scripting is, is an integral part of method. And when we're creating method, that then has to become a, a secondary conversation. Okay, we know this trick is 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 gr as good as it can be technically, or we believe it is. Now we need to think about um, how we prop that up with the language we, we use, right? Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a great way to put it. Mm. <clears throat> so here's a question I have for you because uh, I've done a bunch of consulting as well for TV shows and stuff. Uh, Nowadays, I do some consulting outside of magic uh, for businesses and stuff. Um, have you done that or is there thoughts to do that? Because I always think uh, as magicians or mentalists or performers, uh, our job is to create an experience for the audience. Uh, and I think businesses should create experiences, uh, you know, for for their their clientele. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think you're on the right track. It's just not something that's ever interested me, right? Like for me, financially, I'm at a place in my life where I, I just don't do things that I don't, that I'm not passionate about anymore, yeah. right? Like yeah. like my wife and I are lucky that we're completely debt free. We don't owe any money on our house. We don't owe any money on our vehicles. We don't have any credit cards. Like because we're completely debt free, I can decide to take a year off and I'll eat, because all mm -hmm. I need to do is magic trick it and old Charlie's on <clears throat> Wednesday night for three hours and I can afford to pay my, you know, my electric and feed my kids. Right. So yep. we're just, we have that benefit, but it's also because I don't have, you know, I don't drive a new car and I don't have a boat and I don't have a second house. So we've sort of decided to minimize our, our expenses to maximize our life, like yep. our sort mm -hmm. of uh, happiness, which means I have no interest at all, you know, working with corporate clients to make their business stronger or to, to teach them to make experiences. Um, because what I love doing is, is at its core, I don't, I don't consult because I want to make businesses better. I consult because I want somebody that watches that show to be emotionally destroyed by a magic trick and mm -hmm. not just emotionally destroyed by theater. Right. Not just emotionally destroyed by an experience, but 100 percent emotionally destroyed by a thing that is simply impossible. Right. It's just my drive is to give somebody a, a moment in time that they'll never be able to explain that in the car ride home, every solution <coughs> won't make sense. And that 20 years later, every solution won't make sense. And that's yes. what that's what drives me at my core. Mm -hmm. Um so even though some of my skills translate right now, I'm not interested in translating them over to anything else. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea for magicians. And I think it's a great way to book corporate work for sure. Mm -hmm. um, because I agree with you that, that most businesses don't understand how to create experiences. They don't understand why empathy is important. They don't understand a lot. Like they don't understand how to put on a conference that's mm -hmm. entertaining. And I think we have mm -hmm. all those skills in our bag. And of course it makes sense for us to help with those things, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, I just want to, I just want, I just want to 
I want to create, I don't know if you guys have read my book, Plots, Poison, and Other Cons, but there's a trick in there called Cold Coin that's the strongest magic trick I've ever created in my life. It's for one person in one specific situation. And it's, it's like, I can't explain how, how, how powerful and impossible it is and mm -hmm. how much it affects somebody on like a core level. There's no clever presentation. There's no clever theater. There's just a moment that you give them that they'll absolutely never be able to forget. And mm -hmm. that's what I strive to do. Right. And I, I also think that I on purpose designed that trick to be done for just one person, because when it's just you and them alone in a space and something impossible happens, they don't, they don't turn to their buddies and say, wow, he's really good. They don't laugh about it. They don't, they just experience it in a way that, uh, that, and you don't give them, you know, you don't go, is it, you don't, once the trick's done, you don't go, wow, aren't I great? Wow. Wasn't that a great trick? You just let the experience breathe. And in that space, it breathes yep. so much longer. And yep. like, uh, you know, I'm telling you, those people that have seen me do that trick every time I see them, right. They tell the person next to them about this thing that happened. And man, yeah. it's, it's, uh, when you can get there, it's a lofty goal, but there are a few yeah. tricks that'll get you there. And when you can get there, man, it's like, yeah, that's good. Yeah. I like this question came up. It said, has shirtless Brent uh, made an appearance? Brent, is this a, is this a thing? Shirtless Brent? I, yeah. I have one story about you doing it, but, uh, but I don't, is it, is it more than that? Uh, well, so, so this weird thing happens, I don't know, five years ago or maybe less than that, three years ago, I post a picture of me on Instagram. That's just my shoulders and my arm like this, right? So you can like yeah. see my shoulder. You can't see my nipples, you can't see my chest. And like, I got all this hate for it. I got all these people that like, you know, calm down thirst trap or whatever, right? Like, and, and most of it was just <laughs> friends being like, yeah, legit. So, so then I was like, all right. I we'll posted do this. a shirtless photo once I got so many people unfollowing me. <laughs> <laughs> Cedric told me that he saw, he saw that and he unfollowed me. <laughs> That's awesome. It, it, it's, it's like a bizarre thing. And then at the same time, I I'm, I'm comparing that to like females on Instagram that just will get hits and views. And like their job is to sh show off all the stuff. And it's this yeah. weird world we live in where, where, um, you know, it, it's just a, a, like a strange thing. So I started an Instagram call, uh, an Instagram called shirtless Brent. And that's the whole bit. The whole bit is now it's just pictures of me shirtless, but you never see me shirtless. It's only my shoulders. Right? Nice. Like, nice. There's no chest, that's there's great. no nipple. It's only just, and then we started taking submissions. So now we've had other magicians who've submitted photos and now well, it's a whole I mean, at like shirtless whole, Brent on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. It's a thing. <laughs> and then it became like, <laughs> And then <laughs> I'm waiting for Ryan to take his oh, shirt off. I can't get it off over my head. It's not and ready then, yet. And then it's because it became a thing with customers. Thing, like, man. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> that is so great. So many of the same pose. Of uh, yeah, that's my favorite pose. That's the pose that started all. And then, then it became artsy, right? It was like, like I take weird glasses and pictures and showers. I love and that like, they're all black and white. It's like, yeah, we have a theme, man. We know what's up. Steve, nice. <laughs> Daryl, few Eric Stevens that I'm seeing. Yeah, we have both Daryls. Yeah, both Daryls. There's the other Eric. <laughs> That's nice. the most ridiculous thing ever. That is hilarious. I love that body. Teller is in the background. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> this is that amazing. is great. Brent, you might, uh, all wow. access magic might uh, have to follow someone else on Instagram. Interesting that on shirtless Brent, the first photo. The first photo is, is not you shirtless. With <laughs> Just, you were saving the shoulder for later. That's a tease. It's, yeah. it's the best thing, right? Like, that's what's hilarious about it is there's no like, you know, you never see anybody shirtless, right? You see their shoulders amazing. and that's the bit. So it just became a weird art project. But then we had customers that like, we made bookmarks for customers, shirtless print bookmarks. So when they buy a book, we'd send them out a bookmark. And that like, it just became a ridiculous thing. So now all the time that's we have amazing. people in live Figure chat. Like, says, can we send pics to, or can we send a pic to? Yeah, for sure. You have to follow it first. You have to be a follower in order to uh, to submit. But if you just send an, uh, a message to it at uh, at shirtless Brent on Instagram, we can post your pictures. We expect tons of you all to do that tonight. I know yeah. all those tomorrow, and uh, we'll know that we're making the world a better place. There you go. Just doing the Lord's work, really. Michael Lawrence says, "Please don't." <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's uh, weird, right? Like it's such a strange, like the whole thing just it hit me as a weird art project when somebody was like, you can't post a picture of your shoulders. And I was like, what is even going awesome. on right now? I don't understand. That is awesome. I yeah. love that you took it and made it a thing though. That's, That's the greatest part of it. I had no, did you know that that was a thing beforehand, Ryan? You did, I had no, no idea. I mean, I met Brent five, maybe six, six, seven years ago, something like that. We, uh, we went to an Applebee's in Columbus, Ohio, uh, with myself. And it was like, uh, I think it was like Chris Mayhew and stuff. And we went all, we all went out and I didn't know who Brent was at the time. And then he did his turn restored, uh, you used a uh, a business card at the time, maybe after dinner, uh, and I was like, "Okay, okay, <laughs> this is this is badass." And then he took his shirt off, and it was then it got awkward. So <laughs> took your shirt off a, at Applebee's. You know, I'm not yeah. afraid, right? Yeah. I mean, it was late; it was after midnight. So I mean, they were kicking us out anyways. But then I saw a shirtless print come up, and I was like, "Wow, there other people have had this situation." <laughs> shirtless little well so 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 like i mentioned the book earlier not to plug the book but i mentioned my book earlier one of the things that's in my book is the idea of creating memories for people and that's what the whole book is written on and and those memories don't have to be sane or they don't have to make sense and that's where the shirtless print sort of ideas come from right now i have a whole group of people that when they see me think of me as shirtless Brent and think of the Instagram. Like we have 120 followers. We don't have a ton of followers over there or anything, but those 120 people are getting an experience that's memorable to them. Right. I'm, I'm more memorable than penguin magic. Right. Cause that's the other thing with our brick and mortar.com, you know, brick and mortar magic.com. We're constantly trying to do things that the big boxes can't do. Right. And I don't expect that a jar from, from penguin magic is going to run a, a shirtless Instagram account anytime soon. Right. Um, <laughs> so we can do things like that even in my unboxing videos that i do i cuss like i'll did, say you know did you get, I don't know if did, you get that? did you get that did you get that a jar brent says that you won't do it <laughs> i love so it i love it i challenge it. him but if he's gonna do it he should submit to my page to sure yeah, yeah, yeah. that would be amazing if he sees this hilarious. and does it you know it's crazy but uh, but but and that's what the book's sort of written on like one of the things in the book which is super hilarious is you take uh, a siri and you recorded it saying uh, you've arrived at your destination so you just have the audio, you've arrived at your destination and you save it on your phone. And the next time you're at a sporting event to the airport, you push play and you walk up to the urinal with the speakerphone on. And as soon as you get to the urinal and unzip your fly, Siri goes, you've arrived at your destination. And everybody in the bathroom just laughs hysterically, right? Because it's like such a weird, ab ab absurd moment. Nice. And you don't like hand out business cards later and say, look, I'm a magician. But all you're trying to do is get that guy in the airport to leave, walk out to his wife and be like, you'll never believe what just happened in that bathroom. Yeah. Right. And and th these are just those things that I try to I'm always trying to create like curate yeah. these these moments of like they're not magic tricks. They're just moments that make you memorable and make you interesting and make people. Uh, make somebody go, yeah, last night here in Applebee's, we had a guy who tore up a business card, put it back together, and then took his shirt off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. Whatever those exactly. things are. You know? it's, like, it's like, it's yeah. like fun and interesting, right? Um, That's awesome. Creating memorable moments. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. There's another thing in the book where you, uh, where you invite friends over to play Uno and you cheat at Uno, but it's crowdsourced cheating. So we would take uh, the yellow sixes out, or all the yellow cards and all the sixes out of an Uno deck, and then we would deal one person a yellow six, which means he can't win. There's no way he can ever go out. And then mm -hmm. uh, everyone else agrees that we're never going to win the game. We're just, even if we can go out, we're not going to go out. We're just going to continue to play while this one friend continues to say Uno while staring at a yellow six for hours. <laughs> It's, it's That's genius. Great. Right. And then, yeah. and then you're, and then, and the rule that we have is that like, they have to, you know, we keep playing until they either say the words yellow six or they show everybody the yellow six or they turn over the deck and say what the hell's going on. We'll give an hmm. unwritten rule. So now when somebody new comes into the board game group, everybody's like, hey, let's yellow six them. Let's yellow six them. And then we all just play Uno when a guy can't win and you just hear him go like, Uno, 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 like just getting really, really mad about it. Right? Yeah. It's not That's a magic great. trick, right? It's, and yeah. it's not a magic trick. It's not a con. It's not a gambling demo. It's just this ridiculous thing that at the end, when he finds out, he laughs hysterically. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's really awesome. Ridiculous. Yeah. And it also feels like this is another thing that I'm a huge sort of proponent of the idea of giving people uh, uh, the, the true magic power, giving people in your life, the ability to feel what we feel when we create magic mm. in, you know, we do a show, we say, I'm going to teach you a magic trick. And every time, 
we lied to them every time we cracked the egg into the glass and they didn't really do a magic trick. Yep. So, so one of the conceits I've explored a lot is the idea of what if I could give them the power, not teach them a magic trick, but give them the power of creating the magic trick. And that's sort of what yellow six does. They don't have to do that's anything but not go out and they feel like they're part of the heist. They get to be a part of the bank robbery and have the power that we have when we make the coin disappear, you know? And I yep. think if you can find, I've got a couple of ways in my show where I give the audience the ability to, to really have the power of a magician. And I think it really resonates with them because I don't ever turn it back on them and go, oh no, this thing is, ha ha ha, you're an idiot. The egg really does crack and you didn't really learn how this egg to silk worked or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. I really just give them that power and that ability, which is, it's, it's a, it's a, like the whole premise of my show. It, it, my show is called Through a Magician's Eyes and the, the whole premise is about making the audience into magicians without with one without ruining the magic for them like not teaching it to them in a way where they're suddenly stooged but also um yeah not having it be some kind of gotcha where i'm fake teaching them something and then you know and then pulling the wool over their eyes it's like you know there's very little that i take credit for in the show i'm just simply the the vessel or facilitating them being able to get the feeling of reading their friends minds or astonishing other people Sure, sure. Yeah, it's a fun, it's, it's a fun concept to play with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Again, again, giving somebody that that I don't want to say power, but giving somebody that you know that feeling of being able to be the reason something happened is super. Yeah. Super yeah. interesting for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. Had one one last question because uh, I feel like we're I feel like we're kind of winding down unless we have some great que questions from the chat. <laughs> We just don't want to see you with your shirt off, Brent. That's surreal. That's surreal. <laughs> it's, it's just um, the shoulders. Yeah. Just the shoulders. Um, yeah, you could end if you want to end the show by ripping it off. Yeah. <laughs> Take it off. But, Take it off. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, wow. Just the teeth. Oh, there we go. Great shoulder. Um, <laughs> but, it's a very wow. white shoulder. <laughs> it is very white shoulder. So I, I'll Where the sun don't shine. People. If we're going to have people submit to shirtless brand, I've discovered that this is the thing. I don't know why it works, but this thing. This thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, that thing. It's like like yeah. pretty boy. And you don't have to be like here like pretty boy. You can sort of roll it back. It's yeah. just getting oh, comfortable. Yeah. Or I don't know what it is about the arm and the elbow there, but it's just – it's. I think it's just a little more flesh. If you're doing just the shoulders, it's not enough flesh. But as soon as you throw that arm in, boy, is he shirtless. <laughs> boy, is he shirtless. <laughs> yeah, well, because you get a little bit of that underarm action. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, now there are a lot of people that want to create magic or would like to consult with people or, or would like to be doing just original magic. And I think that there, uh, there are, there's also, you know, a school of thought in magic of that you, it's necessary to study all of the greats that have come before you and build up a, f a solid foundation in magic, uh, in order to be able to create. But I think that, uh, there are some people that naturally make that progression. They build up a solid foundation and then start creating and th they're able to naturally do that. And I think there are some people that get stuck in that kind of cycle of never feeling like they've built up enough of that foundation and are constantly just learning from the past and not necessarily making something that feels like them. So how, where would you say is that? is that balance? Do you set a goal in mind and then start just striving for that goal and then research the history that's related to the thing you're trying to create? Or do you, wh at what point do you kind of uh, feel like it's time to jump off that diving board um, and, you know, and feel confident enough in yourself to start creating magic? Yeah. I think if, if it's art, right. If, if that's how we're ultimately defining magic is as art, I think that anything and everything in between, and that's all a personal decision. What do you want to get out of this and why are you doing it? And if you've never read, you know, uh, Marlowe and Spades, I don't care, right? If you've never read Erdnays and you perform card magic, I don't care. Like if you're getting what you want to get out of what you're getting out of it, the thing that I see is, is the thing I see that bothers me is sort of gatekeeping, right? And the idea that like, oh, you don't even know what Erdnays is? Most of the people saying that have never even really studied Erdnays, right? <laughs> they read it one time and yeah. put it back on their shelf, but they've never really studied any of it. Um, so there's there's some gatekeeping that I don't think is fair. And and the example I give is like, if 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 this is art, there are are, are young kids out there right now picking up a Crayola crown for the first time and and coloring 
and drawing and it's awful but it's giving them a thing and they're satisfied with it and who are we to come along and smack the crayolas out of their hand and tell them they're doing it wrong Mm -hmm. i think just the opposite like let's encourage people to do whatever works for them even if we disagree with it right like even if because this is where we were the gatekeepers 10 years ago said that internet magic was bad right Mm -hmm. and now it's huge and and yep. responsible for bringing so many people into our art that weren't in it three to five years ago, right? Um, so so the best thing to do is just encourage any everyone and then meet them where they're at. When somebody comes in the magic shop and they say, this is the trick that I do, I don't say, oh, it's just the 21 card trick. Let me show you 10 other versions of that are better. I say, let's work on that one you're doing. I don't say, oh, this is wrong. You need to learn the Marlowe version of the 21 card trick because it's better. I say, let's work on where you're at and what works for you. Cause that's the thing that sort of drives me the craziest is that we believe that, that there is a right way, or we believe that there is that, that somebody can't ever be good if they haven't studied the history of magic. And I don't think that's true. There are artists out there that are great artists who've never, picked up an art book and never studied art and, the, and have never been in an art gallery and they're great musicians sorry I dropped my phone they're great musicians who've never studied sheet music right so yeah. so and I think sometimes there's a benefit to that you know there's a benefit to the idea that that if you can't if you're not following in everyone else's footprint you're more likely to end up off the beaten path and create something that we've never seen right? Create something that's unique in yours. But again, for me, it's just about do what, do and find what works for you, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, That being said, I will go back to my statement I said earlier, and that is that if you want to consider yourself an artist, I don't believe it's art until you've expressed it or shown it to someone else. I don't believe art painted and hidden in your closet is art. Um, I do believe that it's a valid uh, uh, sort of a valid way for you to to express yourself or it's a valid way for you to have an outlet but until someone sees that art i don't believe it becomes art um the same way with magic the thing that i will encourage anyone to do even if you haven't read those books and you haven't studied those masters and you haven't i don't think you need to earn the right to create magic right um but i do think you need to perform it for people that's the key i do think you need to share it with people whatever it is to make it magic until then it's just two cards turned over as one but when you show it to someone, that's when it starts to achieve that level of art. And and again, go do the, I'm trying to think of it, like the insurance policy and crush the world with it because it's a great trick. But as soon as you walk into a local magic club or a local magic convention and you do that trick, people will laugh at you, right? Like, just do the magic, listen, tomorrow, go into a bar tomorrow, take a deck of cards, do the crisscross force and then close that thing with the magician's insurance policy. And you will crush that place. Void of presentation. Don't even yep. do presentation. Just go here. I, I have the piece of paper. I'm going to lay here, cut these cards into two piles. Look at your card, open that piece of paper. Like, <laughs> because it's just too good. And we get caught up in the idea of like, Oh no, you should palm out before they cut. You should use the classic force. You should, you know, have multiple outs in the insurance policy so you can pull them out of an index and it can be freely named. And you're like, no, just, just yeah. do it. Cause man, it's a good ass trick, right? Like yeah. it really is. Yeah. I remember hearing someone, I forget who it was. Uh, someone taught this, this woman, uh, sponge balls. And like three years later, she ran into the the magician that showed it to her. And she's like, Oh, you changed my life. She says, I, you know, I practice the sponge balls. I got a job at a restaurant and, and she would go around table to table doing sponge balls. And she's like, I learned three magic tricks and that's all I've been doing the last three years. Uh, and some like, like it's crazy. But to most, uh, you know, I, I don't do sponge balls, but to, to laymen, uh, or not even laymen, we like to now just call them audience members. Sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. I feel like layman is a bad <laughs> name for them, but uh, our audience members uh have never seen magic close up they've never experienced it so uh like you said if you did the insurance policy you're gonna destroy yeah well 
an example of that, right, is that that if it is art, Erdnays is our paintbrush. Erdnays is our art. And there is our brush stroke, maybe, right? And the audiences that, that the art appeals to are never going to pay attention to our brush strokes. They shouldn't pay attention to our brush strokes. Our mm-hmm. brush strokes and our paintings should go unseen so that they can get the bigger picture of the art. And if yeah. we're too too busy sitting around talking about brush strokes and the history of the brush stroke and the history of using this versus that, like we're sort of missing out, which is just create mm-hmm. art and give people that experience, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know about you, man, but I think that was another gold nugget right there. That's a mic drop moment. <laughs> but which I think is a great way to, to cap it because I mean, let's leave it on a high note. Other than lasagna, I mean, that's uh, definitely the highest note of this episode yeah. by far because we went very philosophical on it. Uh, but <laughs> it's not done. The answer has not been finished yet uh, until Magic Live uh, when we try <laughs> to give Brent um, <laughs> an infinity number of lasagnas stacked on top of each other. Yeah. I but, think I'm going to take the Pharaoh Shuffle lasagna challenge at Magic Live and I'm going to try to Pharaoh well, Shuffle lasagna. We should have. We should have d- Events. There we go. Yes, the we got to like X Games. Yeah, we got to have a full-on thing. Yeah, there we go. It's gonna be there nice. we go. Um, one but, v one lasagna tournament. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, Brent, thank you so much for coming on. You were absolutely incredible tonight. I know. Uh, no, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Been on for a while, time. so uh, yeah, we can't wait to see you. Uh, you know, definitely in May. Uh, hopefully before then. Hopefully uh, this world opens back up. But, awesome. um, but again, uh, let's pop up, uh, your website and stuff. So people know where to find you. Uh, absolutely. Brick and mortar magic.com was at least what you said earlier, but that's, that's for the place it. Yeah. And, uh, the magic firm.com would the also be firm. the, uh, the consulting. Beautiful. Uh, and go follow shirtless Brent on Instagram. Make sure and to submit. That's the thing. Like, I want to see a couple of you all submit to the, to the thing. Cause yeah, a hundred percent. I'm gonna send sure, you a photo. I'm sure relaxing. I'm gonna send you a photo for sure. <laughs> Max and Max, cool. Shooting some I like. I like it. Was this comment here that uh, said uh, Grant's been on fire tonight too? It's the pit hair that <laughs> is offensive in my opinion. <laughs> Um, but if you would like to see a lasagna eating tournament championship at Magic Live, where we interview a bunch of magicians, uh, including Brent, then uh, check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash magic and help support our stretch goals so that we can make that a reality. But this has been a blast. I did not know what to expect with this episode. And honestly, this has been one of my favorite conversations that we've ever had in the history of the podcast. Uh, I, I think it's been hilarious, but also really insightful and just really appreciate all of your uh, all of your time, Brent. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm going to go do some research on lasagna so that I'll be prepared <laughs> for our next conversation. That's it. That's it. Good. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much again. <laughs> Uh, Thank you for everybody watching. Uh, We'll be back next week. Unless you're uh, one of our patrons, then we will see you on the weekly patter. Uh, And until then, peace peace out.